Monsieur le Connétable de saint helier Madame le Connétable de Saint-Laurent. Present. Monsieur le Connétable de saint bernard Present. Monsieur le Connétable de la Trinité. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Pierre. Present. Madame le Connétable de Saint-Martin. Present. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Jean. Present. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Clément. Present. Monsieur le Connétable de Greville. Present. Monsieur le Connétable de saint juan Present. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Marie. Present. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Sauveur. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Southern. Present. Madame le Deputy Labbé. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Tadier. Monsieur le Deputy Luce. Present. Madame le Deputy Dublé. Monsieur le Deputy Morel. Present. Madame le Deputy Le Hegera. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Ayer. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Ward. Present. Madame le Deputy Alves. Present. Madame le Deputy Gardner. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Gorse. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Farmer. Present. Madame le Deputy Moore. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Mezzer. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Ozef. Monsieur le Deputy Balash. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Coles. Present. Madame le Deputy Poré. Present. Monsieur le Deputy War. Present. Madame le Deputy Miles. Present. Madame le Deputy Scott. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Renouf. Present. Madame le Deputy Curtis. Present. Madame le Deputy Feltham. Present. Madame le Deputy Binet. Present. Madame le Deputy Jeune. Madame le Deputy Miller. Present. Madame le Deputy Howell. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Binet. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Ferry. Present. Madame le Deputy Kovach. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Curtis. Present. Madame le Deputy Ward. Present. Madame le Deputy Wilson. Present. Madame le Deputy Stevenson. Present. Monsieur le Deputy Andrews. Madame le Greffier. Prions Dieu, notre aide soit au nom de Dieu qui a fait les cieux et la terre. Amen. Seigneur Dieu, Père éternel et tout-puissant, qui a établi les gouvernements et les puissances de la terre, pour le règlement et pour la conduite du peuple, et qui nous a commandé d'avoir toujours pour but la gloire de ton saint nom, nous te prions qu'il te plaise de donner à cette assemblée le don de conseil et de prudence, d'unir les cœurs et les affections de tous ceux qui la composent, et de les conduire tellement toi-même par ton Saint-Esprit, que tu le délibération et en compagnie de ta bénédiction, aille aussi sur bien et au soulagement du peuple qui t'a plus de commettre à le soin. Quand nous t'en prions au nom et par le mérite de ton Fils bien-aimé Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur, qui nous a enseigné de t'invoquer en disant Notre Père, qui est aux cieux, ton nom soit sanctifié, ton règne vienne, ta volonté soit faite dans la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain quotidien et nous pardonne nos offenses comme nous pardonnons à ceux qui nous ont offensés. Et ne nous invite pas en tentation et délivre-nous du mal car toi, le règne, la puissance et la gloire au siècle des siècles. Amen. Monsieur le Connétable de saint hélier Monsieur le Connétable de la Trinité. Défaut. Sir, um, the Constable Trinity is online, but is having um, difficulty just expressing his presence. Um, well, I, I think we will mark him uh, excusé at this point, and if he could make his presence known as soon as he's able to express his presence, um, by either a mention in the chat or something else like that, then I can mark him as present. Thank you. Monsieur le Deputy Tadier. Present. Madame le Deputy Dublé. Defoe. 
Right. Monsieur le Deputy Joseph. Therefore. Les États sont constitués. <clears throat> uh, before we commence the process for the appointment of uh, a new Chief Minister designate, I'd like to address comments which have been made by some members and in the media about the time scale for the submission of nomination to the greffier after the vote of no confidence was adopted last Tuesday. As members are well aware, this is the first time a vote of no confidence in the Chief Minister has been carried and therefore the first time the standing orders relating to the appointment of a new Chief Minister outside of the election cycle have been applied in the 19 years since they were drafted. It's clear that the timescale provided within the standing orders was quite tight, and although these were appropriately applied both by myself and by the Greffier, I'm sure this is something that the Privileges and Procedures Committee will be reviewing in due course. I should also inform members that uh, you can hear the occasional clicking. I have given leave uh, for photographers from the Jersey Evening Post to take photographs up until the drawing of the names from the hat and thereafter no further. Uh, and there is no recorded media other than the usual live stream uh, on the web. Very well. Uh, there are uh, three nominations for Chief Minister Designate, Deputy Mezek, Deputy Farnham and Deputy Gorst. Uh, I'll draw lots to determine the order in which the candidates would address the assembly. I understand the Greffy has brought her tock hat for that purpose. <laughs> and uh, I accordingly will do that now. And as you can see, there are three straws. There's no long straw or no short straw, <laughs> just straws. I will fold them into double twice. Deputy Ian Gorst. Deputy Lyndon Farnham. And therefore, Deputy Sam Mazek will speak third. So, uh, therefore, I will invite the candidates to speak and answer questions, starting with Deputy Gorst, then Deputy Farnham, and finally, Deputy Mezek. Candidates will be asked or be able to speak for up to 10 minutes and then members will have uh, up to one hour to ask them questions. We will display the time and ring a bell to signal when the 10 minutes is up. And similarly, a bell will be rung when we reach the one hour limit. When the three candidates have made speeches and answered questions, then we will take a recorded vote using ballot papers and the candidate who receives more than half the votes uh, will be appointed. <clears throat> when one candidate is speaking, and answering questions, the other two candidates will have to withdraw from the meeting and staff from the GREF will escort those candidates to a quiet room and stay with them until it is their turn. And I therefore ask Deputies Farnham and Mezek to withdraw from the Assembly. Sir, can I raise the defo on Deputy Osif, please? Yes, the defo is raised on Deputy Osif. <coughs> Sir, uh, so, so, sorry. Oh, yes, <laughs> uh, are we able to order, um, have a supplementary question after our main question? I will operate this in the same way that I will operate the 15 minutes of questions we do on a regular basis. In other words, a member will have the opportunity to ask a question and then an immediate supplementary question, but no more than that. And then I will call upon the next member uh, who indicates their desire to ask a question in order. If no member at the time that I... Uh, is indicating a desire to speak and there's time left, I'll permit second or even third questions, but I will always give priority to those who have not yet asked a question if they put their light on. 
Uh, that's the way we operate for the 15 minute periods and that's why I'm proposing to operate uh, the question period now. Very well, Deputy Gorst. Thank you, sir. We meet today to elect the next Chief Minister. Now, more than ever, we need a Chief Minister who can bring together a unified team with energy, ideas and talent, and who can work to heal the divisions of the past and move forward with action and purpose. Making difficult decisions on behalf of islanders is our primary responsibility. Each of us has to try to put aside any differences and focus instead on doing what we believe to be in the best interests of the island. In the time remaining before the next election, we need to demonstrate to those who put their faith in us that we can take the action needed to put the island on course for greater prosperity without leaving anyone behind. We can do that by delivering on the promises we made to make a positive difference to island life. Jersey's reputation and economic success is built on stability and confidence. We do not have time for drift and division. Islanders and people further afield are looking at us expecting and hoping that we begin the process today of restoring stability and rebuilding confidence. I hope, with members' support, to begin that task today. I know that last week's vote of no confidence sent a clear message, a message that the Assembly and the island wants change. Change in who constitutes the government, a change in approach, and changes in policy. If the Assembly chooses me as Chief Minister, I can and will deliver those changes. I have listened to what members and islanders have said, and I have heard. I'm grateful to everyone who has signed my nomination paper or offered their support for me today. People may not always agree with me on every issue, but they know where I stand and what they see is what they get. If I am appointed today, I will nominate a new council of ministers with new faces to bring new thinking, new ideas and a fresh approach into government. I do not, however, take the view that absolutely everything was wrong with the last government. A new council of ministers under my leadership will include a mix of backbench members and existing ministers, giving us the change of direction that members want to see. But it will be a council of ministers that will, work, that will actually be able to work together under my leadership, harnessing the skills of members. It is clear that too many members feel disconnected from the decision-making process in our political system. That needs to be addressed immediately. We, of course, have structures to work within, but that doesn't mean that we can't come together as an assembly and work more closely together. I would open up ministerial groups to non-executive members who wish to play a role in formulating policy and helping us to tackle the big issues that we face. I'll make greater use of the Legislation Advisory Panel and give it the resources and support it needs to produce greater output. I'll work closely with the Comité uh, to connect the centre of government with our 12 parishes, including attending the Comité meetings with their agreement, of course. I will meet regularly with the Chair of PPC and, of course, engage fully and thoughtfully with scrutiny. In addition, sir, I will form a Chief Minister's Consultative Panel with the membership largely determined by members and not by me, so we can discuss key issues facing the island and improve the link between government and the non-executive. I know, sir, that accessibility, inclusiveness and teamwork matter. That will be the approach I take as we seek to get to work quickly and refocus our minds on the big challenges that matter to the public and which are a risk to our future prosperity. On policy, sir, we will always have our agreements and our disagreements. As an assembly, we are here for the very purpose of debating policy and legislation. But I will ensure, however, that policy proposals are properly consulted on within the assembly, not only with scrutiny but other relevant panels, before they are lodged as propositions or legislation. In particular, I've heard concerns about increasing regulation 
and I commit that a government I lead would be focused on enhancing freedoms and choice wherever possible. I will ask policy officials at every stage to think about what is right for Jersey, what works for Jersey, and what is appropriate for Jersey. Members will know that for any chief minister, leadership and visibility matters. It is the chief minister's responsibility to keep ministers motivated, on track, and to be an enabler for success. From 2012 to 2018, the governments I led delivered huge programs of work on social reform, criminal justice reform, and public investment. Members most certainly were not lamenting the lack of legislation in those days. There has, so during this campaign, been some commentary about my leadership style, uh, and I think it was unfair. I am a consensus builder, a bridge builder. I believe on focusing on the issues, getting the job done, and holding the team together. The Chief Minister is also one of the primary external uh, political faces of, of the island, an absolutely crucial role. I hope and believe that I have shown I am capable of communicating Jersey's view to the wider world in an effective manner. Jersey's government has, like many around the world, become overly bureaucratic, which is causing not only an increase in the cost of government, but also to the cost of doing business and ultimately making the island more expensive. And I will ensure that we refocus on actions. I recognise that we must and will do more to help islanders through the cost of living crisis, including improving early years childcare provision. We must and will do more to support islanders through the housing crisis, training islanders for the jobs of the future and ensuring that we can attract the skills we need. On the economy, we must focus on growth and productivity, removing bureaucratic barriers to business and development and creating incentives for investment, continuing the planning reforms and simplifications, but we must go further. Government needs to be an enabler, not a blocker. Fundamentally, we must prioritise if we are to achieve anything. We must deliver the existing hospital project, but just as important is our future healthcare strategy which I think should be built in partnership with the medical profession. I'm not prepared to allow Jersey to become a mini NHS. Internally, I will decentralise, providing much clearer structures for accountability and delivery. Islanders are also crying out for control of public expenditure, and any future growth in public spending must go to the front line. My track record is to invest in public services in a managed and affordable way while saving for a rainy day. And that is the approach I will continue to follow. As members know, I have been Chief Minister previously, and I know what the job entails. I know how to deliver in this role, and I've learnt from previous mistakes. I'm ready to hit the ground running and have the experience this role needs. So the world around us is at a pivotal moment. We have war in the Ukraine, continued uncertainty in the Middle East, interruptions to global supply chains, elections in the United Kingdom, in the United States of America, in the European Union. We must bring stability for Jersey. And I believe that I am best placed to build consensus in this assembly as we get back to delivering positive change for the island we love and the public we serve. So I ask members to come together, to work together, to put Jersey first. I ask members for their vote. Thank you. Well, there's now a period of up to one hour for questions, Deputy Tadier. 
Thank you, sir. Um, the candidate spoke of healing the divisions of the past, um, yet when he was uh, Chief Minister on two occasions, uh, he created a more socially and economically divided community than when he started at the beginning, when the relative gap between the wealthiest and the poorest uh, widened, sir, uh, and, where, and currently as Treasury Minister, we've seen the gap between the poorest in our society and the wealthiest in our society also continue to widen. How can we take the candidate seriously when he says uh, he wants to heal these divisions of the past? So when I'm talking about the divisions of the past in that speech, I'm talking about the uh, situation we found ourselves in last week where we had a very uh, divided assembly. And that is what I am committed uh, to uh, the healing of. We just remind ourselves that whilst I've been uh, Treasury Minister, uh, income tax thresholds have increased to uh, £20,000, some of the highest in the world that's supporting all uh, taxpayers across our community. Uh, we've uh, increased and extended the cost of living uh, bonus that will continue. The Social Security Minister has increased uh, benefits uh, across a range of the benefits that she administers. That will continue. But I have heard, I have heard what islanders are saying about the struggle that they are encountering. They are not easy policy issues to solve. But I commit to working, as I've said, with uh, food banks uh, because they are experiencing and seeing the most financially vulnerable in our uh, community. And together with them, uh, finding policy solutions to, uh, to help uh, deal with those most financially vulnerable. It might be that we need to reintroduce benefits as we did during uh, COVID. But we need policy interventions that are actually going to work and actually going to make islanders feel better off. Uh, Thanks, sir. Supplementary. The, um, so we know that when um, he's talking about healing the divisions of the assembly, not necessarily the wider community. Now, the, the candidate is a pious man, and he'll know exactly what I say when, uh, when I say the words, you reap what you sow, sir. Uh, and when, as uh, chief minister, he implemented £10 million of cuts to, uh, across the board to some of the most vulnerable in society, uh, and we are starting to see the very consequences of those cuts now, does he not agree that actually he has to take responsibility for those mistakes of the past and that actually it's his economic policy here which is at fault? Uh, uh, whilst it might be easy to be humble uh, before an assembly uh, while seeking re-election, that actually we need a change from his leadership to a more uh, a fairer, uh, equal society. Uh, so my entire... Uh, opening commentary was about the change and the change that I believe that I can bring and uh, will bring. Uh, so I know that my uh, colleagues here like to criticise previous governments that I was uh, Chief Minister of and refer to them as uh, austerity uh, budgets. They weren't austerity budgets, so they were about controlling expenditure. Uh, in the uh, final term that I was Chief Minister, um, overall budgets did actually grow by uh, around £30 million over those three years. But that is controlling expenditure. It's reprioritising uh, expenditure. That control of expenditure allowed the government after that to be able to spend hundreds of millions of pounds supporting islanders and supporting businesses during COVID. We can't have it both ways. I will manage budgets. I will live within our means. But I will <coughs> rightly prioritise... Uh, for the priorities of this assembly and the island. Deputy Southern. Thank you, sir. Uh, I wish to concentrate on one phrase uh, from the uh, candidate, which was leaving none behind. And I would like to the, the candidate to inform members how he voted on P113 in 2017, which was intended to leave none behind. It was the reinstatement of the single person's component in income support. How did the candidate vote in that request to rescind that charge? Uh, so if memory uh, serves, I voted uh, against that on the day for all the reasons that I would have uh, explained. Uh, and uh, having said that, of course, uh, a... 
uh, member uh, came back and uh, reintroduced that, and that has remained part of the uh, income support system uh, since that reintroduction. Supplemental, Deputy Sun. Thank you, sir. Does the, man, does the candidate today consider that, that such a move to uh, reduce the benefit of the least able to support themselves, uh, would he repeat that, that same action today if, if he felt it was necessary? So the public finances uh, today are in rude health, uh, not least of which for actions that I have taken uh, over the last two years. I don't think that the deputy has supported uh, those actions or voted for those actions. Because they are in rude health, it has meant uh, that we have been able to increase tax thresholds, uh, introduce benefits, and increase income support payments to islanders. Uh, and I see no uh, eventuality that that will change, unless, unless uh, public finances are not managed in a balanced and robust manner. Thank you, sir. Uh, so prices are up 12% across the board. Food, housing costs are astronomical. What would the candidate do to ease the burden on young families and pensioners who are struggling in Jersey? Uh, so there's not one policy intervention that will deal with those challenges, but I recognise uh, those challenges, and that's what I said uh, in my speech and I have been saying in my uh, engagements. We know, uh, although I've had a, a number of questions from my colleagues in reform, uh, the number one issue uh, causing inequality in Jersey is the cost of housing. Uh, we've had numerous reports which have uh, told us uh, that, and therefore the cost of housing and dealing with the housing crisis has to be uh, a top priority for the next two and a half years. Progress has been made, but more must be done. And I've said uh, that I would introduce um, stamp duty reductions. I would look at reduction uh, of planning uh, fees. I would want to work with uh, and instruct SOJDC to ensure that they are building uh, houses uh, to meet the needs of islanders. I think that there are a number of uh, very capable and interested uh, and experienced islanders that I would, would want to bring into government to help us with dealing with that uh, housing uh, crisis. Um, so could the deputy remind me of the remaining bit of his question? Uh, yes, sir. It's, um, I'm not sure what, what bit the candidate has, has not got. I, I'm, I'm not sure there is a remaining bit that I could say. Uh, thank you, sir, Do you have a supplemental question? Indeed, sir. Uh, as Jersey is a relatively wealthy island, does the candidate think that uh, the continued use of so many food banks is acceptable? Uh, so, no, it is a concern to me, and that is why I commit the government that I lead to work directly with uh, those three food bank operators uh, to understand their experience, to understand the experience of islanders who are visiting those food banks, and to bring forward uh, proposals to support those islanders. Deputy Rob Ward. Thank you, sir. Following on from that, I think I'll change my question. So, uh, a constituent, a young person, young, well, young man, but it doesn't really matter, was speaking to me at the weekend, who is just moving uh, out of a shared house, uh, which they're paying £900 a month for. They did all the right things, uh, and I'd like to say to the candidate, they've come back and they're working in Jersey, they're paying tax. They're moving, the minimum they can pay is £1,100 per month for a one-bedroom minimum. They have to come up with £1,000 deposit to do that, plus £175 of fees for the agency, and there will be a gap before they get their deposit back, if they get their deposit back, for all sorts of reasons. What does the candidate say to these young people and these realities to keep, get them to stay on this island and contribute to our economy? So we've disagreed in this assembly uh, about uh, interventions for the dealing with the housing crisis on many occasions. And I think I've stood here and said to me, it is a great sadness uh, that we use these crises as a political football, because there is no one uh, intervention that will help. 
the fundamental intervention is got to be around supply and demand. Unless we can supply more houses, then demand is going to remain high. And we have to be careful that some of the interventions that uh, the questioner would seek to put into the rented uh, <coughs> sector of our economy will make this situation worse. Not... I do apologise. It keeps timing my, my speech, and I stopped uh, 10 minutes ago. That's £20, I think, I, the bailiff's coffers. Uh, I wasn't now. going to um, say that until the end but of perhaps, the perhaps, time. But perhaps yes. I should sit down and withdraw an hour, sir, before it costs me too much, this, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this candidate chat. I'm not sure my uh, wallet can take much more. Um, the, the reality is that we do need to come together as an assembly to solve these problems. There are no easy answers for those islanders. And we are wrong to pretend and tell them that there are, <coughs> because there are unintended consequences of interventions unless, uh, unless we are working together with all of the uh, stakeholders and unless... We are dealing with the fundamental issue of supply. For supplemental question, Deputy uh, Yes, so obviously the answer is to the young person to just get on with it. Uh, in addition to that, the contract that the pe person has to sign uh, uh, has, a, has clauses including the cost for £250 for professional cleaning at the end. And it would, should they want to move out early, they would have to find an extra an, the, a tenant to take over the rent and pay £750 to allow that to happen. Does the candidate believe that these contracts are fair, reasonable, and what will he do about changing those? Thank you, sir. Uh, so, so some of those uh, issues that the deputy uh, raises are issues that government can look at and can work with landlords, and the new residential tenancy law can look at those and see how they can mitigate those particular uh, elements of, of contracts. And this is the very point that I made in answer to his early questions. We can actually work together across the political divide to help solve some of these issues and to improve Islanders' lives, and I commit to doing that. Colin Tarbison Brown. Thank you, sir. Given recent storms, pandemics and global events, would the candidate advise members how he might ensure the island is resilient to future events and without empty supermarket shelves in periods of heavy weather? Thank you, sir. Uh, th thank you, sir, for the uh, question. Um, the Minister for Sustainable Economic Development is uh, set off on a road to address those very issues. He is absolutely uh, committed to it. The train of work... Uh, that he has got in place with regard to uh, supply lines will mean that we become more resilient. Uh, the other side of that is, of course, is the uh, which I know is unpopular in some quarters, but the redevelopment of the ports to ensure that there is sufficient storage space and that we can have not a simple just-in-time uh, supply line, but we can start to build resilience and reserves there as well. Question, Connor Tom. Uh, yes, sir, thank you. Will the candidate be reviewing our southern trade route and how it can be enhanced to reinforce our resilience? So that is work which is uh, already underway. I, I see no reason to stop it. Uh, we need to ensure that all of our routes are resilient and in difficult times that we can switch from, from one to another. But again, I say to members, that is work which is progressing well and I would keep it going. Deputy Gardner. Thank you, sir. Um, as we are all aware, successful Council of Ministers requires diverse views and at the same time working as a team, as a galvanized team. What processes and procedures uh, the candidate will introduce to bring a stability and consensus to the Council of Ministers, which will allow to get on with del delivery for islanders? Um, I don't think, uh, so if one looks back at my uh, record, uh, that we have not been able to deliver uh, consensus and make some great fundamental uh, changes in uh, Jersey. Um, uh, and I will maintain that. I said in my opening comments, I am a team player. I'm a bridge builder. I'm a developer of consensus. Perhaps what 
uh, the uh, early days of the last two years have shown us is that a council ministers need to have a more formalised process to thrash through policy differences, uh, to uh, work together on building uh, consensus so that we can find a unified way uh, forward. We were able to deliver, and I look across my colleague uh, over the, in the Assembly, the uh, fibre broadband to every home, uh, unheard of across the globe in those days. We were able to deliver uh, Andium homes, uh, which brought every uh, social house up to uh, UK uh, good standards. And they are now, even now as we stand here, a success story and are about the only hope that islanders have of uh, an affordable house. So it is working together as a council of ministers, working through all of the uh, issues, because there will be disagreements, because there's disagreements right across the assembly, whether it's uh, the 10 members or, of reform or it's the 39 uh, centre-right centre, centre -right members. We'll disagree, but we have to put those disagree, work through them first, find policies that work, uh, and then work together to uh, deliver them. I've done it before, and I'll do it again, and I'm offering members... Uh, my candidature to be able to do that. Supplemental question. Deputy Hagara. Thank you, sir. How will the deputy uh, deal with conflict in the team that he selects? Uh, I've uh, led teams that have had quite strong conflict uh, in the past. Sometimes I've dealt with it, uh, but perhaps not as well as I, I might have liked. The member will know that there was a period of time when uh, I really could not work with uh, a minister. Uh, we went through the issues and through the issues, and it found, I found it very difficult. Um, and uh, I would have uh, removed that minister. But after more conversations, after mediation, we were able to work through those difficulties and that individual remained as a minister uh, throughout the time uh, of that uh, second Council of Ministers. It is absolutely fundamental that we... Uh, let's, let's not be partisan now, sir. Whatever way the vote goes today, uh, I want to say, sir, it's absolutely fundamental that each member puts aside their own uh, particular what it is that they might desire and start to think we have made a blow uh, against Jersey stability. Whatever happens today, we've got to put that aside and we've got to say we're going to work in the best interests of Jersey, we're going to work in the best interests of Islanders. We agree what the big challenges are. We largely agree... Uh, Maybe not fully, but we do largely agree around the policy interventions that are needed. And so I uh, stand simply because I believe I've got skills to offer to, uh, to, deal with, to deal with those challenges, to deal with those disagreements and help the island move forward. If members don't want me to use their skills in that way, that's in, entirely up to them. I don't take it personally. Uh, but I am absolutely 100% committed listening to islanders, dealing with the concerns they've got, and making progress on the big challenges we face. Supplemental question, Deputy? No, thank you, sir. Deputy Catherine Curtis. Thank you, sir. The cuts made by the government in Amendment 33 of the government plan included a cut of £47,000 to the police budget. Nearly all the police budget is staffing, so that could mean fewer police officers. The cuts proposed for the children, young people, education and skills budget was £286,000. Fewer social workers, perhaps. These were on top of the planned value for money savings. This was all while the deputy was Treasury Minister. Will the deputy look to reverse these cuts to essential services if he becomes Chief Minister? So the state's currently has a budget of £1.2 billion. Let's, let, let us just let that sink in for a moment. £1.2 billion. Uh, and I would contest uh, that it is possible uh, for departments to provide the services that they prioritise within £1.2 billion. 
I was quite clear with uh, ministers that we needed to make those efficiencies. Ministers across departments got grave monies to do new priorities. If we're going to have new priorities, then something else has got to give. We've got to start prioritising. We've got to prioritise because the service that we've got a, is swamped with policy priorities, with political priorities. And it's partly that that's causing frustration in the community. They don't know what government's doing. They don't know uh, what... They get a press release one day, they get a press release the, the other day, and they're confused. We have to prioritise delivering on the big issues of the day and the big issues that matter to uh, islanders, and that is what I will do. And I make no apology for saying to ministers and members that we must live, with it, live within our means and we must have a balanced budget, because that is what I get the most criticism from islanders about. You are spending is out of control. And we cannot continue. We must prioritise our spending. Uh, when more money comes in through coffers, we must put some aside and we must prioritise onto frontline services. Supplemental question? Uh, yes, please, sir. Uh, will the deputy confirm that his idea of prioritising is to cut budgets on essential services? Absolutely not, sir. I couldn't be clearer. I said it in my vision statement, I said it in my uh, opening speech, and I've said it again today. Right up, St Martin. Thank you, sir. Does the Deputy believe that the decision by the former Chief Minister to announce in the speech to the Chamber of Commerce a reduction in the number of public sector projects to return £30 million to reserves, only eight days after the State's Assembly voted to approve the Government Plan 2024-2027, and not provide prior notice to the Assembly, represents a breach of trust in the Assembly by the former Council of Ministers, of which the Deputy was Minister for Treasury and Resources. And how would the Deputy seek to resolve this? Um, so I always found this a challenging one when I was Chief Minister, that uh, if one's not careful, one has to go out to the community and make a uh, big speech announcing policies, and yet at the same time need state members to have good advance notice and not do anything which has, uh, has uh, uh, recently been uh, decided. And so I will seek to uh, balance uh, those uh, priorities uh, if I'm uh, successful today, any chief minister has to seek to balance those things and not be disrespectful to uh, this assembly. I don't uh, recall that I uh, have previously been disrespectful to this assembly and I would uh, intend to continue not to uh, be so. This is the assembly that makes the decision for islanders. This is the place where decisions are made and that must be uh, respected. It is sometimes easy for ministers to go off to government offices and uh, to be so overwhelmed with work that we forget that this is the primacy of decision-making uh, in Jersey. Uh, and I've heard what members have said. I heard what the uh, chair of PPC said in her speech last uh, Tuesday in that regard, and I take, uh, I take that on board. If I might come to the uh, 30 million uh, of savings. Uh, I accept that there was, uh, there was some, uh, I, I don't, that wasn't my 10 pounds, so no. just, just, just in case. Someone um, else, I, someone else. Yeah, um, I'm going to I, confess, I know. I, I accept that there was some confusion because what that 30 million was, was about how we budget. So every year we get to the end of the year and there is unspent money on projects which have not started. And what the Chief Minister announced, um, I don't know, I've lost all track of days, sir. Uh, at the uh, Chamber lunch the week before last, I, I think it was, uh, what she announced was that, OK, rather than every year just having the 30 million and rolling it over in departments, uh, uh, just saying, oh, we need to use this money, we need to spend this money, and they never do it. It's saying during the course of 2024, I think the states agreed that I could put up to 25 uh, million into the stabilisation fund. But rather than just simply rolling over that end of year money to go into budgets that might get used for something else, it's saying, no, we'll put that money into reserves because actually we know from history we won't spend it during 2024. 
So I apologize uh, if there was confusion about what that was. It was not about stopping projects, and I understand that people felt really frustrated because we'd only just successfully got through a really good government plan in December. Supplemental question, Connie Tom? Thank you, sir. Deputy Ferry. Thank you, sir. Um, in recent years, we've had uh, substantial increases in the minimum wage, and now we are above both Guernsey and the UK. So how would the candidate, would the candidate explain how he will achieve realistic increases in the minimum wage going forward, sir? So I am uh, one of those who, I've got to say, I think I've become a little bit frustrated with this continuing uh, conversation. We, we need, as an assembly, to put this issue to bed. We've, uh, our colleagues here on the left have rightly, rightly reminded us uh, about how difficult some islanders are finding it uh, across the island. And the underlying answer is to see wages uh, increase, to be people to be paid a uh, fair wage for a fair day's work. That's not the uh, a view of the left. That's, a, in my mind, a good conservative principle. And I think we've lost sight of that. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. That will mean that minimum wage will, uh, we will need to work towards increasing it. And I would like to see it increased. And I do, despite the report that I know uh, the department issued, which has been, I think, misrepresented for political purposes, but we'll put that to one side. I do think that it is time that government took hold of the living wage issue. Didn't, as much as my good friends in Caritas, Jersey, when they started doing it, I encouraged them to do it because I thought it would stimulate the conversation and it would stimulate businesses to think about the salaries that were, they were paying as well as we had this legislative uh, minimum wage. I think it's, they've been doing that for a number of years. It is about time that the government took hold of that now and it started doing a proper... I don't mean any offence to Caritas there because they just take the UK's uh, minimum living wage and they do an uprating. It's about time that that was brought into government and government did that calculation so we can move and see increases in, in a stepped way. But, and I put the caveat in, is because there are some industries and some islanders' jobs that if we just do it without compensation and working with those industries, jobs will be lost. So we do have that balance. We must commit, be committed to seeing uh, a good day's wage for a good day's work, but we must also support those industries and those jobs that we do not want to lose, otherwise they will fundamentally change our economy, and that would be wrong as well. Supplemental question. Thank you, sir. Yes, supplemental. So what does a candidate believe to be the best mechanism for realistic minimum wage increases, sir? Well, I do think the mechanism that we've uh, got has increased the minimum wage by over 20% in the last couple of years. So it's working. It's whether we in this assembly are more ambitious to deal with the uh, challenges of low wages and working with those industries of agriculture and hospitality. I think we are ambitious. I think we do want to work with those industries to protect their jobs. Uh, that would, that's the right thing to do. But at the same time, we want to see Islanders getting a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. Deputy Kovac. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question I want to ask uh, all three candidates. It is a, sub it is a subject raised uh, almost weekly on social media uh, by the public and I also asked it to the current uh, Chief Minister during last sitting. Uh, my understanding of Fort Regent is that although the safety assessment is still ongoing, the roof structure already seems to be safe and the uh, uh, main hall must be safe as it was ongoing used as vaccination center until recently. Uh, given all this, if elected, what immediate action would the candidate take to put Fort Regent back in full use as soon as possible? Um, I don't think there is a plan to put it back into immediate use. Uh, and this is one of those areas that is uh, being worked on. 
needs to be worked on. Uh, I would, uh, was hopeful that the previous infrastructure minister uh, and the constable of St. Helier were going to make progress. I think they had plans which were sensible, uh, which were probably not too costly, uh, and used a good dose of common sense. Um, I can't tell the questioner exactly how much progress was being made, but they seem to me sensible and reasonable, and I would uh, support those. But they cannot be, it cannot be at the expense of the other big infrastructure priorities that the government has. Supplemental question? Yes, thank you. So once the full assessment uh, will be completed, uh, then what does the candidate uh, see to be the future plan of the Fort, Re Fort Regent? Well, I think the, uh, the question about the uh, future plan is quite difficult. My understanding and recollection was that there would be um, leisure activity that there would be uh, sport moving back to the uh, uh, fort. But I think on a practical, common sense uh, basis, rather than a big, uh, all-encompassing spend. Deputy Dublé. Thank you, sir. Um, does the Chief Minister candidate agree with me that the legislation giving children with same-sex parents equal rights, which is currently tabled for the March sitting, uh, pending the scrutiny review, should remain on the order paper? And will he commit to enthusiastically supporting it when it is debated? Uh, I think the legislation, so is correcting a <coughs> historic wrong, uh, and it should be brought to this assembly uh, for debate. Um, I suspect any incoming uh, council of ministers or minister would want to uh, get themselves fully acquainted with the legislation before they committed to uh, an actual um, debate date. I know that Treasury Department has got the same with independent taxation. Uh, we're looking for scrutiny to uh, scrutinise that uh, independent taxation. This uh, piece of legislation falls into that same category. We've got to be really careful that we don't allow the interregnum of the, if I might call it that, of the vote of no confidence and the selection of a new set of Council of Ministers of putting legislation and action off track. It needs to be picked up straight away. Supplemental question, Deputy Dublé. Thank you, sir. I would not like to see that legislation delayed in any way. Um, does the Chief Minister candidate agree that the consequential amendments that also need to be uh, continue to be worked on and lodged in order to bring the law into force, is, is the candidate committed to ensuring that the necessary resources are in place to complete that work so that the families do not have to wait any longer than they have to? Uh, so, yes, I am. Uh, the issue, of course, is that we do have this interregnum. Uh, and therefore we can't do those things during uh, this interregnum period. But we can pick them up and do them as soon as it is completed. Uh, and I, for one, sir, can't wait to get to that point. Deputy Scott. Thank you, sir. Um, coming back to the candidate's reference to balancing books, I just wanted to come to the subject of his understanding of the delivery of value of money. Um, in the absence of a systemic review of the performance and governance, governance of delivery vehicles, um, including the state's owned entities um, for which the, he has been responsible as Minister of the Treasury, and the absence of uh, zero budgeting within departments um, as per the Controller and Auditor General's um, recommendations. Uh, so I wasn't sure there was a question, but I can certainly talk on that topic for a few minutes, if you wish. Um, 90 uh, seconds, so, if that's all right. Oh, so. thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, I see I've got a lovely length of time still to go. Um, uh, so there is a uh, review of arm's length organisations, contrary to uh, what some people uh, might have misread uh, in uh, the media. Uh, it's moved uh, into the chief executive <coughs> office, and it's an important review, and it's addressing uh, those very issues that the deputy refers to about value for money 
uh, for those arm's length organisations, and I am fully uh, committed to it. Um, I might say uh, something a little bit controversial, if I may say, I know it's not within my uh, normal modus operandi, um, but it is a been a constant source of frustration to me over the last two years, being the Minister of Treasury and Resources, around the constant uh, requests from boards for uh, pay increases. Uh, and I've looked at those pay increases, and as I say, I've become frustrated with them. I've taken them to the State's Employment Board, and I had a very uh, interesting conversation with the State's Employment Board, and I think we came to the conclusion that actually, whilst the non-executive pay might be uh, within the remit of the Minister together with the Board, that I think that needs to change, one of the areas which is most frustrating is the senior executive's pay uh, within these organisations. And that is the thing that I would wish to uh, get to grips with, because I think that is the thing that islanders are most frustrated with. Uh, if we've got largely monopolistic arm's length organisations uh, uh, expecting to be paid salaries uh, of the equivalent large organisation in the UK where they are operating in a market and do are expected to uh, compete and make a profit. Uh, I don't think we're counting like for like, and that does need to be addressed. When it comes to um, zero-based budgeting, I've had those conversations with the Controller and Auditor General, and I, as a young accountant, uh, used to uh, wax lyrical about zero-based budgeting. Sadly, in my experience, and uh, I'm getting on a bit now, sir. In my experience, zero-based budgeting, unless it is done well and there is a commitment from those doing it and those managing the organisation, it leads to increased budgets, not reduced budgets. So it's all about the management, it's all about the political leadership. And unless this assembly and ministers are committed to zero-based budgeting to help reduce and control and provide value for money, they will be unsuccessful. Supplemental question, Deputy Scott. Yes, sir. Um, the, um, the, the, the entities for which the um, Minister has been responsible are state-owned entities such as States of Jersey um, Development Company, um, Ports of Jersey. So um, I would appreciate him um, explaining his approach towards that, that them and also explaining why a timetable for the review of arms length organisations hasn't been produced, notwithstanding um, it's been 18 months since the, uh, the government actually um, was created. So I think a lot of it actually uh, comes down, sadly, to uh, prioritisation. Every department and every minister has got more things to do in their department than there are time. Uh, there is time in a day to do. I think that some of these arm's length organisations have got to deal with the pay issue, as I've just mentioned, but some of the arm's length organisations, like SOJDC, are absolutely key in delivering on our other priorities. And we should look at them not as a shareholder, not as an arm's length organisation, but as a delivery partner to deal with, uh, in those two cases, the housing crisis. And that's uh, how uh, I will act, and it is what I intend to do. Uh, thank you, sir. Apart from uh, seeking to revitalise Fort Region, what practical steps would the candidate take as Chief Minister to support our tourism and hospitality industries? So I think uh, as Treasury Minister, although I might have had to drag one or two of my colleagues uh, to uh, this position, we have uh, kept... Uh, fuel duties uh, at the same level that they were that we came into office. We have uh, s sadly had to increase uh, AMPO on uh, alcohol, but we've had robust uh, arguments being made around the Council of Ministers' table. I would wish to see those AMPO levels kept low or frozen, uh, because I think that has a uh, fundamental effect. Um, but we also know uh, that the necessary skills and the necessary people to work in the visitor economy is uh, critical, and I am uh, supportive of uh, allowing those organisations to have 
uh, non-licensed uh, additions to their regulation of undertaking licenses. I'm supportive of the uh, removal of the fee for uh, those licenses that was uh, recently announced. And I'm supportive of the work that the Sustainable Economic Development Minister has been undertaking and seeking to uh, bring large European brand hotels into our community. Uh, that is fundamental to uh, refreshing uh, our visitor economy. Supplemental question, Colin Tom. Deputy Jean. Thank you, sir. Recognising the significant retention challenges in Jersey's health and education sectors, what specific and immediate steps does the deputy plan to take to address the current outflow of professionals and enhance retention within these crucial sectors? So I'm a great believer that if you want to address problems, sometimes we just need to gather together a group of willing, uh, able and committed people uh, to deal with those challenges. And the reason I say that in this instance is because we did have somebody in the delivery unit who'd started doing a fantastic job in dealing with these issues. And if I am absolutely honest, and I don't want to, I will spare that uh, lady's blushes. Uh, I'm absolutely honest, uh, if I am successful, my first action in dealing with that issue will be to pick up the phone to that person and see what it takes to get her to come back to help us address those issues. Because she made progress. People were staying. New people came with professional, uh, 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 who were the pro right professions in the right job uh, and improving Islanders' lives. We've got to stop making it hard for people with bureaucracy who are committed and can get things done. That is the first practical thing I will do. Supplemental question, Deputy Jean. Yes, sir. Um, thank, thank you. And of course, this if you are unable to persuade uh, the person to, to come back. Through the back, chair, please. Uh, Sorry, sir. Uh, if you are unable to, uh, if the deputy is unable to persuade uh, that particular person to come back, uh, what were the particular uh, steps that the the deputy will take and and, and carry on um, to ensure that there is the retention? Thank you. So the piece of work that was being undertaken was uh, multifaceted. It was really getting rid of the bureaucratic uh, barriers. It was uh, helping people to uh, see the advantages, getting, uh, ensuring that there was accommodation for essentially employed people. Uh, I will do all those things, but I have to be clear with the deputy that without that individual, it will be so much harder. I will not look for another. I know I don't give up uh, because it's got to be addressed. But the key, and it is, I have often found this in my working life, the key is to surround oneself with first-class people. I always say people better than myself. Surround yourself with first-class people who are committed and dedicated and you get a job done. Colin Tarbison, John. Thank you, sir. Sir, what would the candidate do to find a resolution to the ongoing teachers' pay dispute? So, the, um, firstly, I want to thank the questioner for all the work that he did in seeking to uh, work with teachers and resolve that uh, dispute, often uh, unseen and, I know, in the public eye and sometimes unfairly criticised, in my view. Um, we, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that the offer of a, a three-year deal is probably uh, the right approach. But we know that the education department has had substantial growth money, uh, and it seems to me that a priority for an incoming government is dealing with the teacher's dispute. We want teachers to be in the classroom teaching our children and giving them a future. And so we need to sit down with teachers and look at the budget that's in the education department, because we know we've used all the uh, budget for salaries. Uh, we know that the terms and conditions work is ongoing. Uh, and I think that we should look there from that growth budget to see if some of that can't be reallocated to help us solve this dispute, because it's got to be solved. 
Supplemental question. Uh, thank you, sir. So, does the candidate support the letter that was sent to all teachers recently? Thank you. Uh, so, the problem is, in hindsight, uh, we say, well, the letter could have been written differently uh, and could could have been given more thought. But again, uh, states employment board were under pressure. They were being advised to get that letter out in advance, I think, of uh, being able to make the payments and get those details. We need to just take one step back from that letter. It's caused a lot of uh, difficulty and upheaval. Uh, it's not, I, I am absolutely committed to believing that a three-year pay deal is the best approach so we don't get into this situation again over the course of the uh, next two years. Uh, Sometimes, sir, uh, when you're in these situations, when you're in a negotiation, you have to take one step back in order to move forward, and I think that's where we are today. Deputy Miller. Thank you, sir. The financial services industry is the engine room of our economy and produces a significant amount of income that the government applies <coughs> and, and uses to fund public services. Will the candidate tell us what he would do to protect and promote the industry and ensure its continued success? Thank you. Uh, so there are a number of work streams ongoing uh, in regards to uh, financial services. As we know, uh, the most important one as we uh, stand here is the completion of the Moneyval uh, review. Now, I know, sir, being the minister together with the questioner, uh, that that has been painful for industry, uh, and we have had to make some really quite difficult and challenging decisions in order to what we hope will be uh, a successful outcome. Uh, but we must continue working on that. Uh, that is still a work in progress. Uh, that will be uh, released later uh, this year. We will see what that report has got to say. But I have for a number of uh, months, if not uh, years now, uh, believed that we need to reimagine how we regulate. We must be a risk-based regulator. We, uh, it could be said that some regulators have really taken on the same mantle as governments and become very bureaucratic and form-filling uh, focused rather than having a risk-based approach. I actually think some of the information that has needed to be uh, gathered for the Moneyval process will mean that the regulator can have a more risk-based approach going into the future. The keeping uh, of our corporate tax system is absolutely fundamental, and I stood in this assembly before uh, and supported that. We're going to have some really, uh, I think, uh, gr opportunities to grow the uh, finance industry as we bring forward the OECD corporate tax uh, changes. There will be opportunities to see growth markets in the uh, US uh, arising uh, out of that. I've always stood and supported the financial services industry. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm getting so much criticism from my uh, colleagues here to my right. Um, uh, and I will continue to do so. Supplementary question, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, sir, thank you. Um, we saw yesterday Guernsey Finance uh, relaunching and rebranding itself under the brand of Guernsey Finance. Um, other jurisdictions have similar bodies to represent and promote their industry. Um, will the deputy support uh, Jersey Finance to continue its work supporting our industry subject to the ELO review that he's already mentioned? Uh, so Jersey Finance is the gold standard when it comes to promoting uh, small international finance centres. Perhaps it, it's been taken a little bit for granted. Uh, I've heard things uh, said about it. I've heard uh, some members comment on it. We cannot take it for granted. There are other centres out there uh, that would like to eat our lunch. Uh, I, sir, am committed to ensuring that that is not the case, uh, that we promote financial services, that we support Jersey Finance. Yes, that they are providing value for money. That's critically important. I acknowledge that. But let us not uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater in uh, such a review. Let us make sure that we continue to support the promotional elements of uh, Jersey Finance uh, because they are a great success. 
Deputy Coles. Deputy Coles. Yes, sorry, thank you, sir. Um, sir, uh, the candidate said in his opening remarks that he doesn't want to see Jersey become a mini NHS. Uh, does that mean the candidate does not support um, the use of external, um, sorry, I've forgotten the word, the um, external standards like NICE guidelines in health practice? <coughs> Uh, so I think that is a simplistic uh, approach to uh, standards. There are uh, standards in healthcare. Uh, yes, there are those, and I think we largely do now follow NICE with some exemptions. Uh, but so I, I recall a meeting uh, which, which was going to be tricky, Deputy Binet will, uh, will confirm, with consultants at the hospital. Uh, he was there, I was there, the health minister was there, I'm not sure if the chief minister was there, maybe she was, uh, and we had what could have been a very tricky meeting talking about the new hospital, quickly moved on to talking about how we could co-create, and I don't like that modern la uh, management language, what it really means is you're working together, you're taking the skills of the people you've got, and there were first class consultants coming to Jersey because it's not the NHS and they were worried that some of the, uh, that as we were reforming, we might go in that direction. And I was so inspired by what they had to contribute and what they want to contribute to our health strategy going forward. And that's why I say we must work together to deliver that strategy and not simply say we're going to be the NHS. Supplemental question, Deputy Coles. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, so with that, with that in mind, does the candidate uh, accept that it is better to sometimes take the best aspects of the NHS as well as dividing to a new policy that is better suited for the island? So in regard to healthcare, it's always best to take the best uh, practice from uh, around the globe. My point was that we have consultants who now have practised around the globe, and the point of working together with them to uh, develop this strategy is that that is exactly what we will be doing. Deputy Felton. Thank you, sir. Um, given that the candidate has held the office of Chief Minister for two terms and has been one of the only common denominators in the past few governments, um, what was his vision when he set out on that uh, particular aspect of his career? And is the jersey of 2024 reflective of that? Uh, so there are many challenges that we face in 2024, uh, and I don't shy away from them. There were many challenges that we faced in uh, 2012, and I didn't shy away from them uh, then. But we, we remind ourselves that if we think uh, that all of our issues are simply uh, generated locally, uh, then we are misleading ourselves. We have had a global <coughs> pandemic. We have had the financial crisis before that. I was chief minister in all of the years post the financial crisis. They were difficult, challenging times. But I think our record uh, stands for itself. Uh, in the last government, we had the uh, global pandemic. In this government, we've got war in Ukraine. We've got crisis in the Middle East. Uh, we've, all of these things are leading to imported inflation and high interest rates. So it's nice that people think that I am so influential that I am the author and architect of all of our woes. Uh, but let's just be clear where, uh, where our challenges arise from. But more importantly, let's focus on what we can do to deal with those challenges. Supplemental question, Deputy. Thank you, sir. Um, during uh, the candidate's final act as Chief Minister at the end of 2017, the candidate brought in the former CEO who proved a highly divisive figure in the island before his departure with uh, £500,000 to pay off. Um, the candidate also lodged P1 2018, which saw more powers taken from ministers um, and given to the CEO. Does he regret any of those actions? 
So hindsight is a very uh, sometimes painful uh, journey. Uh, the reality is uh, that I would certainly uh, not make the same mistake of appointing a CEO at the end of a term of government not knowing uh, what the electorate would do in regard to uh, appointing a government. Uh, it, I should not have done it. And the reason is because that individual was a very uh, strong-willed individual uh, and needed a uh, strong-willed political team in order to point them in the right direction. That sadly did not happen. And because that didn't happen, I have no choice but to say I regret that decision and I shouldn't have made it. Corrie Thompson Lawrence. Thank you, sir. I was interested to hear the proposal for a Chief Minister's consultative panel. Will the Deputy elaborate on that, please? Will he explain the objectives and how he envisages it working? Uh, well, sir, I have to be careful with what you know what they say about uh, imitation if, is the sincerest f form of flattery. Uh, you yourself have a bailiff's uh, consultative panel uh, made up of uh, state members, and I think that works uh, incredibly well. And when I uh, thought about this pro proposal, it was in the mirroring of the approach that you take to harnessing members' view uh, that I was imagining in the creation of a Chief Minister's Consultative Panel. If, if I may say so, sir, I would prefer them to meet uh, rather more uh, regularly. I think it probably needs to be on a fortnightly basis. And the aim is to discuss the political issues of the day uh, and to hear what members are saying and hearing across <coughs> their parishes from islanders about issues that need to be addressed. Supplemental question, Conita? Yes, sir. I think um, really to know the how it would be constituted, um, what numbers the um, deputy is thinking about um, inviting or, or, or the procedure, sir. Uh, so I would be intending to invite interest from members and then uh, having selected those members, uh, make a proposition to this assembly. Uh, so that they could approve the uh, membership. I'm Im imagining probably about six people, uh, to be honest. Deputy Balash. Sir, so does the uh, candidate support the uh, Reform Party's manifesto commitment to remove the constables from the states? Uh, well, sir, the way they voted last week, uh, no, 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 of course I do not. They are the heart of island life. And it, it really is a disappointment to me that in the last two years, we have somehow largely in government lost the support of the constables. And that to me shows that there has been a disconnect between us and the parishes and what the constables are telling us. And that's why I say in my opening comments, it is really important, if they'll have me, I'm looking to the Conitab of St. Blog, uh, that if I'm successful, that I do attend upon them uh, more frequently uh, because it's critical to our success that government works with the parishes which are the heart of island life and that the top of those parishes are the mothers and fathers uh, of those parishes. So being chief minister sometimes feels like being a father or a mother of the island. The reality is the constables are the fathers and the mothers of the parishes, and we should treat them with such respect. They do a first-class sterling job, and they are all that's good about Jeff. Supplemental question. Uh, uh, there may be a time for one last question. Deputy Morell. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> um, is, in the uh, candidate's estimation, is the United Kingdom representing Jersey's interests um, effectively in regards to immigration and uh, helping the staff shortages that we have in the island? Um, and if it, if it is yes or no, how would he ensure that Jersey is able to get the staff 
that businesses in Jersey so desperately need? So I think the deputy knows there's not an answer to that question in the 30 seconds left because it's very nuanced. Uh, the relationship with the United Kingdom is a historic one. It is an important one. But we must not assume at all times that they are acting in our interest. We must make the case for our interest. And I think that the minister to which the questioner is sitting has done a first-class job in making Jersey's case, particularly around immigration. I know she's got plans to improve that and to broaden that. And the reason I can be confident in that is because what she has done is now what the UK are doing for themselves. Well, thank you. That uh, concludes the period of questions uh, for Deputy Gorse. And I would ask uh, Deputy Gorse to uh, withdraw from the chamber and for Deputy uh, Farnham to be brought back. With the, uh, the the laptop that uh, sounded, was that one, one of? Uh... <coughs> Would anyone like to admit to the fact that their laptop sounded? Um, Deputy Gorst is already paying twenty pounds worth of fines. It seems to me that we could have at least another ten. There we are. Well, didn't sound like it was online to me, so uh, that's a disappointment. But there we are. Deputy Farnham will now have 10 minutes to speak to the Assembly, after which, as previously, a period of an hour is available for questions. Up to 10 minutes, Deputy Farnham. Thank you, uh, sir. This is an election about change. We are here today to elect a new Chief Minister because this Assembly carried a vote of no confidence in the previous Chief Minister and her council of ministers. The assembly voted for a change, and a change must be delivered, <laughs> sir, not just a cabinet reshuffle. What the island needs to see right now is stability and some unity from us. We are living in exceptional times with exceptional challenges where ex exceptional solutions will be required. We need a chief minister with proven experience, sound judgment, and the ability to make tough decisions and provide a clear vision to tackle some of the very real challenges we are going to be facing. <coughs> Being te deputy chief minister, sir, during the global pandemic, I believe has demonstrated my ability to work under intense and prolonged pressure and also to deal with some of the most difficult decisions members could possibly imagine. One of the uh, key requirements of the Chief Minister is to represent uh, Jersey, sir, on the international stage at sometimes the most senior levels, an area in which I do have uh, extensive experience, sir. I also bring experience from all corners of the Assembly. And I cannot stress enough the importance of the scrutiny function. Since the last elections in June 2022, I have served on the Corporate Services Scrutiny Panel and the Privileges and Procedures Committee, and have benefited significantly from working alongside my fellow backbenchers. And this has provided me with a new perspective on the work of the Assembly, enabling me to bring a well-rounded approach to leading the government, which I believe to be important, sir, for any chief minister. I will bring a different style of leadership and new skills to the role. First and foremost, courtesy, respect and professionalism 
will be guiding principles for the new government. <clears throat> If I'm elected as Chief Minister, communications within the Assembly and across the island will be improved. I will ensure that members are informed about government plans and activities before anyone else. We will aim to provide a better understanding of the political landscape and to build consensus and maintain stability. A better understanding of the needs and concerns of the public, sir, is crucial. Greater empathy is required to help craft policies and address the diverse needs of islanders. We will aim to provide an, an, an improved ability to analyze problems, propose practical solutions, and make decisions, sir, that benefit the public. We will demonstrate the ability to adapt to changing circumstances and emerging challenges. We must remember, sir, that our commitment is not to each other, but to the people of Jersey through this assembly. I believe we have lost our way. Government has become too cumbersome. It tries to do too much, sir, and in reality achieves too little. So we must streamline. We must identify our major problems and solve them, one by one, if necessary. Affordable housing is a critical component of any thriving community. It is the foundation for ensuring that individuals and families of all income levels have access to safe, decent, and affordable homes. It is simply not right that some islanders cannot even dare to dream of buying or renting a home, sir, and as a result, many are leaving. So we must fix that. Two years ago, we, we rezoned sites for a thousand homes, and I am not aware of any progress to date. We must simplify the planning process to speed up the production of new homes provide the essential infrastructure that is delaying housing developments around the island. <coughs> Reintroduce the state's loan scheme. Provide additional support for deposit savings and shared equity schemes, sir, to name just a few of the potential solutions. We must prioritise healthcare, which must be returned to the higher standards we used to see providing our residents with access to the very best possible facilities and services. And we all know, sir, that the hospital is one of the biggest issues we face. For the avoidance of doubt, I am committed to seeing the current plans completed, costed, presented to this assembly for approval, and a new hospital, sir, delivered without further delay. Education is the foundation upon which our future is built. I am committed to investing in our schools, providing teachers with the support and the resources they need, and ensuring that our young people have the skills and knowledge to thrive in an ever-changing world. A strong education system, so it's not just an investment in our young people, but in the collective success of our whole community. We must sir, also invest in our teachers and we must find a solution which settles the pay dispute. <coughs> uh, let's also sir, make it easier for businesses to do business here in Jersey. I would like to see excessive and unnecessary regulation reduced sir, or removed altogether. Our new government must be more representative of this assembly and should be compiled <coughs> upon ability, experience and commitment, sir. We must forget, we must forget personal grievances and wipe the slate clean. This island needs a more unified council of ministers who are prepared to listen to islanders and to listen to the assembly, sir. 
and I pledge to listen to members' ideas and concerns, engage in open dialogue, and work tirelessly to create a government that is transparent, accountable, and responsive to the needs of our community. My vision, sir, for Jersey is for an island that provides a high quality and <coughs> an affordable way of life for all residents, to create a prosperous and sustainable community with a thriving capital, sir, which is in Helia that embraces a unique natural beauty, rich heritage, and vibrant culture, while also being a sought after destination for visitors from around the world. We must strive to be a leader in renewable energy, waste management, and conservation efforts. Through sustainable uh, practices, we must preserve our environment and natural resources for generations to come. We must maintain Jersey as a well-regulated leading finance center an island which continues to be well regarded on the international stage. Because how the outside world perceives us is incredibly important. Maintaining strong external relations, international development and overseas aid is vital for Jersey's own development and prosperity. A place where we value and promote diversity and inclusion by promote, providing equal access to the opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded and marginalized. So the challenges we face are great, but our potential is even greater. We must focus on delivery. We must focus on making life better for Islanders, sir. And I ask members to place their trust in me, sir, to help me heal the divisions and move this assembly forward and our island forward, sir, to the benefit of all. Thank you. Right, there is now a period of up to one hour in which uh, uh, members can ask questions. Deputy Sutton. Thank you, sir. And I'll ask the same question I asked the previous candidate, which was, uh, how did he vote in when, when he came to P113 of 2017, which is about the reinstatement of income support to single parents? Um, sorry, sir, I cannot remember, but... Sorry, sir, I can't remember. He voted against the rescindment of such a measure. So you don't have a supplemental question? I've received because no answer yet. <laughs> um, well, no, you, the answer you've received was that the deputy didn't remember. You then stood up and said something else. That would normally be your supplemental question. Do you have a supplemental question? Deputy? Supplemental question yes. was, would be, um, <clears throat> I remind him that he voted against the resentment of the component for single parents. What empathy was he showing then? Uh, uh, well, sir, uh, uh, clearly I, I wasn't showing um, empathy to the single parents at that time, sir, and for the avoidance of doubt. I think given the uh, huge changes in the, uh, in, in, in the cost of living and the challenges, especially uh, the, the lower income uh, families are, are, are suffering at the moment, sir, I think if the same debate was had again, I'd be likely to support it. Deputy Taddy. Thank you, sir. Um, d d if uh, elected Chief Minister, would um, he maintain the 1% revenue for arts, heritage and culture uh, in future budgets? And, and does he accept <coughs> that um, having such a provision has actually been very beneficial for not just the arts sector in Jersey, but also as an economic multiplier on the more general economy? The short answer to that, to that is yes, and of course, credit must go to Deputy Tadia, whose proposal it was that actually um, delivered this uh, to, to the Assembly. And we worked um, well together then when he was Assistant Minister. And I, I think it's proven to be um, extremely beneficial for the arts. And we are now beginning, because we're funding them 
uh, at a more realistic level, I think we're at, on the verge of seeing some, some great benefits for the island from that, sir. Thank you. Fundamental question. Thanks, sir. I, I don't ask the question because I was the mover of that, but because I want to establish whether the uh, candidate accepts that there are times when a well thought out uh, investment with a clear vision and strategy behind it can actually be good at delivering outcomes which may not be immediate but might take a few years to come through. And that actually, if we do it correctly, um, we can see that economic benefit. And conversely, does he also accept that if we make cuts in the wrong places, which are cuts and not efficiencies, we will also see um, uh, perhaps the opposite effect happening? Yes, and I remember um, the discussions we had uh, about that and the strong uh, uh, resistance at times from the Treasury, who are rightly keeping an eye on, on, on the bottom line. But when you make decisions, that are, are quite groundbreaking. For example, the, uh, the, the, that proposition to increase the uh, uh, support for that sector, sir, to 1% of our, uh, of our revenue um, expenditure um, uh, was, um, I think, once we, once we agreed to it, we, once it went, went through, sir, and was accepted, I think then suddenly people, their misgivings fell aside and we started to see the benefit. And I think we need to be a, a bit more pragmatic about thinking in those ways where, where, we're, where we're going to have to read <coughs> money in the future, sir. Thank you. Um, there was a flurry of members who indicated a desire to ask a question over there. I'm not sure I got all, and nonetheless all the lights have gone off. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I haven't got Deputy Bash, I got the others, yes. Um, very well, Deputy Dublé. Thank you, sir. Could the candidate elaborate on his views on uh, equality of opportunity for society um, as opposed to equity in our society? Um, I, th I think, um, as, I, as I mentioned in my opening uh, uh, comments, sir, uh, in, in inclusion and equality is about, I think, providing equal access and opportunity to um, all members of the community, especially minorities and those perhaps that might otherwise um, be, be marginalised. So I think, sir, my answer is it's, it's, about, um, it's, a, it's about providing equal access to everything that everybody else has access to, sir. Supplemental, Deputy Dublé. Thank you, sir. Does the candidate uh, commit to keeping the same-sex parental rights legislation uh, lodged and debated, and will he enthusiastically support this and provide any necessary resources to complete the consequential amendments? Um, the short answer to, to, to that, sir, is yes. I'm not uh, fully aware of the consequential amendments, yes, but I would hope they can be fully supported too. Deputy Scott. Thank you, sir. Would you be committed to achieving um, value for money um, in your administration? And how might your approach differ from the current government's? Sorry, sir, could the deputy just repeat the question? I couldn't... If you could repeat the question, and if you could address it through the chair, it's not could you, but um, could the could the candidate? Oh, sorry, the deputy? sorry, sir. Right. Of course. Um, would the candidate be um, committed to achieving value for money for taxpayers? And how might the candidate's approach differ from the current government's? Um, uh, yes, sir, we have to drive out value for money. I think we have to look at reprioritising re and redirecting quite um, a lot of the, sp the spending, sir. Uh, and I think there, there are opportunities uh, that need to be examined fairly quickly where we can drive out greater value uh, for money, sir. And I would mention I think, first off, our arm's length organisations and state-owned entities. I think there's a, a lot of opportunity for collaborative work in there. Thank you. Supplemental question, Deputy Scott. Thank you, sir. Would um, the minister, I'm sorry, would the candidate um, accept that um, the uh, arm's length organisations could be a barrier to um, full collaboration with um, the public in terms of um, delivering policies? Um, my, my experience with the arms length organisations has always been very positive. They, they operate um, and drive forward uh, the policies that we put in place, both through this assembly 
and, uh, and the government. Uh, I think there could perhaps be uh, bent, better interaction with some of the arm's length organisations and state side entities through, through the states and the shareholder uh, uh, function. And I, I, I believe we should continue to support them, but look where we can drive out better value, sir, as I said before, by better collaboration. Conor Tarbs, the saviour. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I too will stick with the same question for all three candidates, sir. So, um, shipping up 19%, freight services, gas, electricity, fuel, all gone up. Prices generally up at least 12%. Uh, food and housing costs astronomical. Um, Jersey, I've read, is the uh, eighth most expensive place in the world to live. What would the candidate do to ease the burden on young families and pensioners struggling in Jersey? Thank you, sir. The rampant uh, rise in uh, inflation and the cost of living in Jersey is largely due to geopolitical challenges um, that we're facing and we have little control over, sir. But there is, uh, there has been, and I think there are some, some measures that we can introduce fairly quickly that will help, sir. Um, members may be aware of the report of the anti-inflation strategy the group from 2020, uh, 20, sir, which recommended six key action points. I won't go through them all, sir, but um, some couple of those points were uh, the government should understand the impact of indirect taxation and, and monitor uh, their own price increases uh, against the impact that will create uh, on, on the cost <laughs> of living, sir. Some, I think some, although some quick wins we've had some, uh, that have been very well received by the public are the moves to reduce um, GP fees, free GP fees uh, for children, uh, and, and free bus transport. And now that those things don't have a, a, a big impact on the overlying RPI, but they are certainly well received and, and benefit those people that use them. And so, so we need more of that. Supplementary, sir. Yes, supplementary. Thank you, sir. Um, as I thank the, uh, the candidate for that response, sir. But sir, as Jersey is a relatively wealthy island, does he believe that the widespread use of food banks is unacceptable? It, 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 is, um, it is unacceptable uh, to many, sir, but unfortunately it, it's necessary at the moment. And I think we need to gain a better understanding of, of, of why uh, they are there, what we can do to support them, uh, and what we can do to perhaps um, alleviate them. I would like to see a time when we no longer need food banks and we must aim to, to get there. <clears throat> Deputy Robert. Uh, thank you, sir. To follow on from that, and I too will ask the same question without trying to turn us into some form of experiment. Um, so I, I was speaking to, to um, a young person at the weekend who is moving home, uh, is currently paying £900 a month rent, has to move, will be moving into a one-bedroom uh, flat, which is a minimum price of £1,100 a month, will also need £1,000 deposit and pay a charge of £175 for fees from the agency before getting their deposit back and hopefully getting their deposit back from the flat they're in. What can you say to this young person who works here, pays tax here, is committed at the moment to the island to keep them on the island given the extortionate cost of housing on this island? Thank you, sir. You know, so that Je Jersey is, despite the cost of, of living here, it's one of the safest and most stable places uh, uh, to be, sir. And I refer to the experiences of my uh, own children, sir, who um, often say, do you know we could buy so much more for our, our, our money or rent so much more if we moved um, uh, somewhere else? I would ask, I would say to these young people to try and stick with it because this assembly has to get on side. And as I said before, I, in my address, the, the affordable housing issue, providing safe and affordable homes for families of all income levels, has to be our top priority right now because people are, are leaving the island. So I would say to them, sir, just try and bear with us uh, and we will make a, a, a difference, sir. We have to make a difference. There is no real option other than to do that because of the, the, the grave situation we find our, ourselves in, sir. And as I 
said there are some things we can do very, very quickly that would make quite a big difference if we are to focus on them and actually be bold enough to do it. Supplemental question. Yes, please, sir. And you'll be no surprise to hear that it is this, um, the part of this was the really no choice but to sign a contract that includes um, uh, if they were to break the contract, they would need to find a new tenant and still be charged £700 for, uh, for doing so, plus a £250 charge at the end for professional cleaning. Will the, minister, will the candidate commit to making changes to these draconian contracts that people have no choice but to enter into if they want a home? Thank you, sir. Yes, so there's no place um, in our society for draconian um, measures in contracts like that, sir, which served only to exploit uh, uh, people, sir. So I would certainly uh, uh, commit, and I hope any new government would commit, sir, to changing that situation for the better. Deputy Wall. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Uh, would the candidate, um, sorry, sorry, I understand the candidate, if successful, would look to nominate uh, members of reform to the Council of Ministers. Um, can I uh, remind the candidate uh, the pledges uh, that are in the Reform Manifesto? Uh, rent freezes, uh, making open ended tenancies the default, uh, taxing empty properties. Sir, We've had a, report, uh, a feedback from my residential tenancy law, and we've had an incredibly, I think, 300 uh, responses to that report. Uh, these uh, views are extraordinarily controversial. Uh, so would he back these uh, pledges, or would he look to seek compromise from the members of the Reform Party? Um, I have... Um had a conversation with the leader of Form Jersey um, end of last week, sir, as I did with Deputy Gorse on the run-up to this election. And um, as we have repeated in the media, sir, we have not made no deal, sir. Uh, the, uh, the leader of the Reform Party um, suggested that they could be interested in working in government and that we would talk again after this election. I said, sir, I would be amenable to that, and uh, that's where we are. We also know, sir, I have the greatest respect of, for the Reform Party and their members, sir, and we work together and we agree on some things and we disagree on other things, sir, and that's healthy politics. That's what we are in here to do. What we have to do, in some instances, is find a compromise, and Reform has to do that, and I think they're realising now that they have to do, might have to do that a little bit more while still pushing for their policies um, and there are some things, sir, that we will just never agree on. And I think we have to accept that. But that doesn't mean we can't work together. We have to work harder to win our arguments. Supplemental question, Deputy Warren. Uh, <clears throat> yes, sir. I mean, if uh, I, I would ask the candidate, if he can't find agreement uh, around the council minister's table, um, uh, I understand that Deputy Medic walked away from the last government simply because he couldn't find agreement. Uh, and I would like to understand... Uh, if, if that happens again, um, does he just accept that certain members of the Council of Ministers would walk away and uh, that would cause complete chaos once more? I think the does he accept was the question. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, uh, having worked more closely with Reform Jersey members over the last two years. So I can only say it's been a very positive experience. Whilst we have disagreed on many items, we've managed to work our way through it. Uh, and I think this assembly should take a lesson from that, sir. I can't predict what will happen in the new government. I, I think, I hope I have a reputation for compromise and working together with people. In all my times as a minister, with my assistant ministers, we, when we had differences, sir, we managed them very well and always found a way through, sir. And I, I, I feel confident that we could do that with Reform Jersey, the members of the former government, with other members. That's how we have to work in this assembly and the government, sir, if we're going to succeed. Deputy <coughs> Gardner. Thank you, sir. The last question actually moved me to ask a different question, candidate. Um, I understand that the deals haven't been done, completely accepted. As candidate indicated, he would welcome Reform Party at uh, his Council of Ministers. Obviously, negotiation needs to take place. Also, Deputy Bine 
supporting candidate, and uh, I assume that it's also option. Now, reform manifesto, we will establish public service adjustment to enable <laughs> islanders to seek real redress when failed by government service. Tom Bine in his interview after work, uh, Deputy Bine, Deputy apology, yeah. Deputy Bine in his interview after long was very clear that he'll scrap the plans to establish public adjustment. Would candidate advise the assembly his views and would his government establish public obdusman? Well, sir, I haven't. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations with Deputy Binet this week, but we haven't talked about the ombudsman. Uh, and, and I have to say, sir, right now, um, I, I think um, I, I'm probably leaning towards uh, support for a public ombudsman. So that's a conversation that we're going to have to have uh, around a new council of ministers table, sir. Uh, but I'm not insistent. I would open that up for debate, and if necessary, bring it back to the Assembly, and we deal with it democratically. We can agree to disagree, sir, and still work together. A supplemental question, uh, Deputy Gardner. Absolutely, and the candidate mentioned in his speech it's important to have a unified council, and within council there is completely opposite views on public abdusment, how he would unify the government. Um, I, I think I will make it clear and we've, to, to new um, potential government uh, members that, that compromise, sir, is going to have to be a place where we will find ourselves at times, and we have to accept that. There's no guarantees that, that members um, can compromise on everything. I know uh, some members in the past have been uncompromising. Um, but that's because I have particularly strong-held views. So I can't guarantee there won't be fallout, sir. Uh, and, and I know the previous government, sir, uh, started with great hopes, but then ultimately saw four members uh, uh, resign, sir, during that course, because they failed to reach compromise. It's about give and take. If we're going to move forward, we sometimes have to let go, sir, of what we believed in and fought for passionately before, sir, as I have demonstrated with the hospital, sir, to do what's in the best interest of Jersey. Like I say, our, our, our aims, our, our goals are for, our, the goal, our goals for the people of Jersey, not for supporting each other, sir. We need to make the right decisions for the island. Thank you. Sir, I believe my question wasn't answered because I asked what candidate will do to unify the government with opposite views. Well, I think uh, it was a question of urging, uh, urging compromise upon uh, on members are making it clear that that was the tenor, that was the answer I heard, and it seemed to be an answer to the question. So uh, the question has, in my view, been answered. Deputy Jen. Thank you, sir. Has the candidate read the Violence Against Women and Girls report published in November, in which a great many people shared their experiences and percep uh, perceptions? Which specific recommendations does the deputy feel are the most important in the report to prioritise? Um, thank, thank you, sir. I've... Um... I have a well-thumbed copy of the, the executive summary. I haven't read the full report, sir. It's a huge and comprehensive uh, report, sir. There are 77 recommendations, sir. Um, the task force, sir, laid out clear and specific recommendations for change, including the need to address immigration policies that com compound, violence, uh, uh, exper uh, compound the violence experienced by women who have not resided in the island for five, sir, five years. So that was one that particularly uh, uh, jumped out, sir. And also um, the need for urgent <coughs> specialist counselling support for victim survivors um, is, cu is currently extremely limited in the island. So that's another uh, one I, I picked out on. Uh, and that was mentioned in, in, in their release, sir. And I, I think we have to look very closely at, at our legislation, and I can't remember the particular parts of the legislation that was referred to, sir. But I, I think, I know this is quite a high-level answer, sir, but we certainly need to examine the, the legislation or the lack of legislation that was highlighted in the report. So, I have a question, Deputy Jean. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, 
and, and going beyond the specific report, there are obviously uh, other important pressing challenges that face diverse women and girls in New <coughs> Jersey. Could the candidate outline the specific strategies and initiatives that should be championed to ensure equal opportunities for, the, for women and girls, regardless of their background and identity? Thank you. So I, I, I just can't do that off, off, off the top of my head, sir. But I am uh, reassured by the comprehensive re report that we have that that will guide, act as a very, very useful guide, sir, in, in the new policy that we have to make. But I do undertake, sir, to support the report. I can't say that I can support every one of the 77 recommendations, because I, I haven't got them all in front of me, sir, but I would hope we can support at least the vast majority of them and work with the group, sir, to make significant improvements and improve the, uh, and, and reduce, significantly reduce with the aim to eliminating violence against women and girls, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm also going to ask the same question like uh, the other candidate, uh, as was a subject raised uh, often by the public. Uh, my understanding of Fort Regent is that um, it's an ongoing uh, safety assessment, but we already know that the roof is safe, and we assume the main hall is safe because <coughs> uh, was used uh, until recently as a vaccination center. Given all this, if elected, what immediate action would the candidate take to put Fort Regent back in full use as soon as possible? Regrettably, sir, uh, Fort Regent was one of the projects that was cancelled by the incoming uh, government. Some budget had been reserved for that, and work ha had started, sir. And I know many members, like me, feel ashamed that we've just allowed this this wonderful asset to deteriorate. The, the plan, uh, sir, we had in place is, is a good one, sir, and I think we should look at returning to that. I think we should put together the uh, the. the the, the body, sir, the, the task force, the action group, whatever it was called, um, we should put together a group of states members to oversee that, sir, and look to bring Fort Regent back to its former splendour and provide uh, a, a, a great asset and amenity for Islanders, sir. I won't, I don't have time to go through the, 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 the old plan, sir, but it is, a, I'm sure it's available somewhere online and members should look at it because it was very good. <clears throat> A supplemental question. Yes, thank you. Once all safety assessment is completed, then how soon would the candidate initiate those actions? And uh, what does he see uh, as main activities uh, he wants to see going forward in there? Uh, we'd implement it as soon as possible, sir. Um, and uh, amenities, sir. Well, one, one thing I was particularly keen on was the uh, creating new access from town. Uh, from, from the Snow Hill part, sir. The uh, members, <coughs> members will be familiar with Fort Region. The, the, the views and, and the environment up there is absolutely uh, uh, fantastic. And, and I, I think we can, a lot can be made out of, uh, of the gardens and the public realm up there, sir. The indoor winter garden with, with another uh, a great idea, uh, which will, of course, provide year-round um, facilities. Uh, and then, sir, I would like to see uh, leisure facilities uh, for our young people, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, Connie Tarperson Brillard. Thank you, sir. Given recent storms, pandemics and global events, would the candidate advise members how he might ensure the island is resilient to future events and without empty supermarket shelves in periods of heavy weather? Thank you, sir. We, I, I think um, uh, the constable knows because he's familiar with our contingency plans, or, or, or some of them at least, um, because we are, we are vulnerable uh, on the grounds that about 95% of what we consume is, is important, sir. So if the boats don't sail, then uh, we don't get fed. And I think that has to be the, the biggest challenge is, is around our, our ceilings. And I know there are strong contingency uh, plans in place, but it is concerning, sir. And when I was uh, the minister, and I'm sure uh, I can speak for a uh, deputy Morell, who's the minister, um, it 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 is it is uh, an issue, sir, a subject that we have to keep a very close eye on on a regular basis. And we work, we have good contingency plans, sir, and we work very closely with the UK or, or authorities, sir, and the military, sir, uh, in, in in relation to those contingency plans. Supplemental question, Colonel Tower. Thank you. So, would um, uh, the candidates um, consider enhancing on-island storage? Thank you, sir. 
Um, well, sir, I, I, I would, but they, they, I would, but there would be a significant uh, cost involved. The retailers now run just-in-time stock systems. Um, um, most of the shopping habits have have, have changed uh, with consumers. So most of what we buy is is, is fresh or with very limited shelf life, sir. Uh, and, and cans and long long life goods, sir, are, are not sold, I believe, in the quantity that warrants uh, large storage areas, sir, or makes them feasible. So. It is, it is challenging. We discussed sir, at the outbreak of uh, COVID that uh, in, in increased storage on, on island storage, um, uh, but that required, and, and, and the supermarkets, the large retailers sir, did that, but that required financial support, sir. And I'm pleased to say we didn't run out of toilet rolls at the time. Thank you. Deputy Ferry. Thank you, sir. And like my previous question, this relates to minimum wage. So um, we've, over the last two years, we've seen uh, substantial increases in minimum wage, putting us above the UK and Guernsey. So what will the candidate do to achieve realistic increases in the minimum wage going forward, sir? Well, we, we made, this assembly made a commitment to the living wage, and I believe we've got to stick to that. But I'm also um, uh, realistic about understanding the financial pressure that puts on small businesses who might not be able to afford it, especially in sectors such as agriculture, uh, tourism, hospitality uh, and retail. So if we are going to go to the living wage, I think we have to be prepared to provide some bridging, some financial support to small businesses to get them there and then support them until they can adjust their, their business to maintain those pay rates. Thank you for supplemental, uh, and I thank the candidate for his answer. Um, so what does a candidate believe to be the best mechanism for achieving realistic rises in minimum wage, sir? By a mechanism, sir, does the deputy um, uh, um, mean that the process which we follow now for deciding increases in the minimum wage? Okay. Uh, I was referring to the best calculation and the best mechanism of setting the minimum wage in future. So. I, I, I don't think there's any uh, thing wrong with the work that the, the forums have been doing, the minimum wage forum. I think that works that works fairly well. And we should, could, should continue with that, sir, remembering that this assembly has made a decision to move to the minimum uh, wage, sir. And I'm not sure that clearly doesn't always align with the work the forum are doing. So again, sir... I think there needs to be a conversation uh, where everybody sits down together and, and perhaps finds a solution to that. But maintaining, maintaining the route we, we use now, sir, has worked, has worked well, albeit there is a bit of a gap in timing. Deputy Balash. So the candidate has uh, rightly spoken of compromise in the Council of Ministers. But uh, the difficulty with the uh, Reform Party's manifesto commitments is that many of them are binary. One is either for them or against them. For example, the removal of the constables from the states, uh, the removal of USA as president of the assembly. Uh, would the uh, candidate compromise on some of these issues in order to keep the peace? Thank you, sir. I don't think those are issues for the government. Those are constitutional issues for the assembly, sir. And no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't move on those. I want to keep the bailiff and the constables and bring back senators, perhaps. Maybe the deputy would support me on that. Do you have a supplemental to that, Deputy? Uh, oh, well. Alex Curtis. Sir, sir, just before that, would you mind reading a list of the names that? that are on there, because I, I believe I pressed the button and thought it had been enlarged some while ago, and I just don't know whether it was missed or not. Very well, those who are still to ask questions on my list is Deputy Alex Curtis, Deputy Stevenson, you, Deputy Morrell, Deputy Ozef, Deputy Lehegara, Deputy Poray, the Connet Arbison, Helia, Deputy Alves, Deputy Renef, the Connet Arbison, John, and Deputy Miller. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Deputy Catherine Curtis, I know I am to that list. Yes, uh, Deputy Alex Curtis. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, successive uh, hospital projects have been plagued with consultancy and design costs uh, that are hard for the public to reconcile with the outputs. What expectations would the candidate have 
on their ministerial <coughs> lead for the project to scrutinise these costs personally and report to the Assembly on them. I mean, that was a, a, a very similar question I'd been asking the previous governments uh, time and time again, and despite Deputy uh, uh, Binet's efforts, uh, we, the, the, the costs were, were not forthcoming. We have to have transparency in the hospital project, and that means uh, being transparent about the cost, being transparent about the timing, being transparent uh, uh, about the logistics, being transparent about the financing, sir. And I believe Deputy Binet will do that. So I will support him to do that, sir. I will encourage him, and I hope the government will encourage him, to follow the process, the correct process, which is seeking the approval of this assembly on the project at every appropriate step of the way to get it over the line, sir. The, we, I think we, we, we can't look back. We have to look forward now. And um, there can be no further delays. But I believe this assembly will only support it and should only support it if the project demonstrates the appropriate amount of transparency. transparency. Thank you. Supplemental question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, beyond the high-level costs, there are many granular costs in uh, capital projects uh, that can make the difference between an affordable project and an unaffordable one. So uh, does the candidate give his commitment to ensure those granular costs, such as planning, consultancy fees, traffic and road network simulation, engineering uh, and landscaping costs are all released proactively and do not require questions to ministers? I can, I can only wish, sir, on, on, on that one. Uh, but I, I think the most important thing, when pro pro because the previous hospital project did include, or, or, or it wasn't just a hospital with everything as, as this new one it, is, uh, but the biggest enemy, the biggest um, um, challenge to, to that is delay. Uh, and, and we've seen that. If you delay something, if you keep searching for a better option and keep searching, all you do is delay and that only achieves one thing, putting the price up. So, yes, I, I would support that, but this assembly and, and, and the government actually has to stop messing around. And when they agree things, they have to get on and do it, rather than try to hang around for a better idea or, or to gain some sort of political advantage there. When we agree things, let's get on and do it. Deputy Stevens. Thank you, sir. Um, the candidate has made some quite grand promises on Fort Regent, which given the question we've just had about affording um, a new hospital is particularly interesting to me. How does he propose to pay for it? And um, will that include returning to the original plan as he stated he wanted to earlier, um, including a casino as part of the business plan? Uh, so there's a good example, sir, where stopping a project uh, has put everything in limbo and will probably only have it in increase the costs. Uh, if I uh, remember rightly, sir, there were opportunities for private I I investment uh, in, in Fort Regent, uh, whether some, I think, can't remember, I think I'm trying to remember, some of the estate I think could have been, could have been earmarked uh, for residential, sir, some for commercial, some for leisure. <laughs> and of course, the question of a casino uh, uh, came up, sir. I personally don't believe that Fort Regent would be the right place for a casino. And I'm not sure that Jersey is the right place for a casino. That's a, a debate this assembly will have to have in the future. Supplemental question. Yes, sir. So given that the, as I say, the previous business plan was based um, largely on being able to afford it due to what was raised from a casino, will um, the candidate accept that the plan that he has just promised the Assembly he will return to and deliver is now unaffordable? Um, no, 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 sir. I'll explain it again, sir. Uh, what I've said is there are opportunities to partner with the private sector, okay? Part of that was with a, a casino. If we decide not to go with a casino, then we have to look for other opportunities. That could include residential developments on the outskirts or land swaps uh, with a private developer in other parts of the island. We give them some land. In return, we invest that money in Fort Regent, sir. Hotels, leisure facilities, uh, uh, and other things like that, sir, would generate a significant amount of income. Maybe not as much as a casino uh, uh, would, sir, uh, but it and it would, but it would certainly generate income, which would I, I believe would still make the, uh, the development or, or the project viable, sir. But again, we have to look at the figures again because I haven't seen them for a couple of years. Deputy Thank you, sir. <clears throat> 
Um, a great deal has been said about cost of living and um, also resilience, as the comment of St. Prillard mentioned. And so, sir, um, it's current economic <coughs> development policy to um, help with both impact both of those matters by uh, increasing trade to Europe through um, the establishment through the private sector of a, a southern freight route and also um, uh, encouraging and we are and have been currently in talks with European supermarkets that may wish to set up in Jersey to provide competition to the current sector. Both of those would help with resilience and the cost of living, sir. So um, could the candidate explain to the Assembly whether these are matters which he would seek to continue as economic development policy, or is this something that he would prefer to see ended? Thank you, sir. I, 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 I strongly support that, sir, uh, and, I, and I would support its continuation. Um, and I would hope we can be more successful than we have in the past because we've been trying to develop stronger Euro European trade links with our French neighbours and, uh, you know, as a, a conduit as well from other parts of Europe. So it's sort of perhaps more challenging now post-Brexit because we've lost our, our unfettered access to some of those markets. Um, and, of course, we have a, a sort of a different... When it comes to food, we have a, a different culture. We're very, very anglicised. We have much bigger brand recognition with the, with the British, the UK brands, than we do with the French brands. I like nothing more so than spending uh, an hour or two in a large car for supermarket when I'm in France because I have some fantastic products. But, unfortunately, it's a huge challenge to, to get that and get the volumes necessary in the Channel Islands that we need. But I'm fully supportive, so we must keep, keep trying. Supplemental question, Deputy. Thank you, sir. Well, the supermarket is certainly knocking on our door, sir. Um, it's, it, it is the case, in my estimation, that over the last 20 years, Jersey's links with France have been, have been weakened and frittered away by successive governments. Um, the candidate is absolutely correct that the UK government does not make that any easier, but I personally have invested large amounts of my time um, in rebuilding those um, political and business relationships with France. Can the candidate commit to continuing this work, sir? Um, because the last 20 years, in my um, estimation, have been an appalling car crash in terms of relations with France. Well, I disagree that it's all been an appalling uh, car crash when we look over the 20 years and we look around the assembly at, at members who have done um, tremendous work uh, with with, with France and developing our relationships there, and I mentioned Deputy Oza and one or two others. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we have had our ups and downs. We've had fishing crises and, and Brexit and the likes that haven't really helped, and some of the government responses haven't been too clever at the time. But as the Deputy knows, when he was Assistant Minister, I supported him in his endeavours to build links with France, sir. and if we were to work again in the future, he can rely on my support to continue that work. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the candidate just mentioned me, and um, he and I have known each other well. Um, I've been elected with him since 99. Um, we've served, I think, in one um, uh, council of ministers where he was a minister and I wasn't. And he just said, sir, um, uh, it was right at the right time. And so this is no way critical. Perhaps in an earlier question, he may, and in asking uh, lessons learned, it is no way critical when a decision maker, often with the benefit of hindsight, you know. The Ombudsman proposition was one I brought as a backbencher. When the facts change, it, you change your mind. The candidate um, said um, the cannabis industry would be the new finance industry and we'd have a new hospital to pay for it. Um, uh, it could he comment on that, and in specific issue uh, related to the cost of living, would he kindly say, as the former economic development minister, um, and the importance of competition policy, which he answered in an earlier question, would he, does he know what's gone on in the rest of the world about competition law changes, and the fact that actually there is an embedded, would he agree that there's an embedded risk in Jersey that inflation is higher here than it is elsewhere because of a lack of competition policy and law that is in small places advanced, but Jersey hasn't. Would he give a government, and who's his next economic development minister going to be? So, point of order, how many questions are we allowed to ask now during our <laughs> opening? Well, um, best policy is, 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 of course, one. The reality of it is most members manage two or three, uh, and it's up, to the, it's, up to the, um, it's up to the responder how many questions he answers. Yeah. <clears throat> 
we go, we go in reverse order. I'm not sure who the next economic uh, development minister is going to be. It will be up to the uh, assembly, I'm, although I have had some good conversations with members who have shown an interest. Uh, I'm not fully up to date with competition law evolution uh, uh, around the world, but I think it was even deputy as if we might have even actually in a rare, uh, on a rare occasion worked together a long, long time ago to establish what was the competition authority. Um, what the anti-inflation report did highlight uh, uh, amongst one of the levers we do have to help control inflation is, is strong uh, uh, competition. Uh, I'm not sure how that's working. It, it was working in some markets, but not particularly well in others. Um, but perhaps we do need to change our legislation so, but like I said, I'm a little bit out of touch. In relation to the medicinal cannabis um, industry, sir, I, I, I don't remember saying it was going to be the new financial services centre, and I think that could have been taken slightly out of context. But what I did hope was that if it worked, if it could be developed, it could produce significant financial benefit. Uh, and, I, and I still hope it can, sir, and I still hope it's something that the island <coughs> can, can, can work with and, uh, and develop, sir, for all the right reasons. Thank you. Well, the mental question, then. I'm, I'm, great, I'm grateful, sir. Can I just press um, the candidate? I'm grateful for his answer. The issue, the, if, if I say to him, he would understand, that the competition law issues are really at the cart of and the cost of living crisis is really massively waiting on people's households, will he undertake, under his... Uh, Chief Ministership, um, to put the cost of living issues at the very highest level of um, his government's priorities. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pleased to say, sir, say, sir uh, yes, I will, along, alongside affordable housing. I think, I think those are the two most pressing issues for Islanders at, at the moment, sir. Deputy Hegra. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. My previous uh, original question has been answered, but I would like to ask the uh, deputy, uh, following on from the questions asked by Deputy Jean. Part of the um, uh, report in relation to violence against women and girls talks about work permit holders. The question, therefore, for the deputy is this. Will he, if he is elected as Chief Minister, ensure that the legislation in relation to modern-day slavery is pushed up the agenda? Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Supplemental question? Uh, Deputy Bore. Thank you, sir. Uh, with reference to the future economic development, is the candidate familiar with one of the ideas brought forward to boost the economy, uh, which is to create a European modern style hotel um, by the previous government, obviously that idea. If so, how does the deputy plan to increase the supply of seasonal migrant workforce, particularly when the recent review on the welfare of migrant workers has shown that the present policy has been failing seasonal migrant workers who are invited to this island to help the economy to thrive. Um, um, thank you, sir. I, I know that's an important issue. Migrant workers are absolutely essential um, and should be made welcome here. They should be uh, properly um, um, protected by relevant le uh, legislation and, uh, and regulation, sir. And I think that we, we're going to need another conversation on that. I'm not fully aware of where all the weaknesses are, sir, but we need to identify them. And I would undertake to uh, ensure we can close or, or any gaps, any problems that are, uh, are causing the issues. Now, the deputy has a, has a much better understanding of the issues than I do, so we need to have a conversation. Uh, supplemental question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, does the deputy believe that the focus uh, from the previous government on producing an information <coughs> booklet for seasonal workers prior to arriving in the island, making them aware of the, their rights, their obligations, and the way of life is sufficient and therefore the best that the government can do to protect workers from exploitation? Thank you. Well, I think providing information um, is always helpful, sir, but it's clearly uh, not not going to work if, if, if our legislation and our regulation is not doing the job, sir, and leaving people uh, exposed to problems. <clears throat> Colin Tarbison, tell you. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, what steps would the um, candidate uh, take if he's elected and perhaps having declared an interest uh, to support the tourism and hospitality industry? Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, well, well, members will, will know that I've had a strong uh, political interest in, in tourism and I have uh, a business connection, uh, sir, which is uh, duly declared on my interest, sir, but it's a far, far more distant um, association now than, than, than I've had in the past. Tourism is essential to Jersey for so many reasons, sir, because the thread of tourism and the benefit of tourism runs just about through everything uh, that we do on this island. It, it, it touches everything economically, socially, environmentally. Uh, and of course, it is uh, part of the reason, a big part of the reason why we enjoy such good transport links, sir. What I'd like to do uh, is, like we've done with arts and culture, like we've done with, with agriculture now, is review tourism to make sure that they are getting the adequate uh, uh, funding to continue to safeguard the benefits that, that we've seen. I, I, I'd also like to see, because if we do that, sir, and we maintain our air, air, air and sea links, sir, that will give the private sector confidence to then invest in, in more bedstock. And, and once we get that, that formula running uh, collectively, then we can start to see some growth again. Uh, yes, it's a, a practical step. Does the uh, candidate support the uh, re-establishing of a customer-facing tourism office in a central location? Well, sir, I, I think I, I do. I do, sir, but, but again, that would have to be, I, I think, uh, dependent on additional financial support for Visit Jersey because they don't see it as a priority with the limited budget they have, sir. I have to say, um, I, 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 I rely on my mobile phone for tourist information, my visit place, but I, I, I do understand that many visitors to Jersey don't, sir, and they would like to see that face-to-face -face opportunity. So if we're prepared to pay for it then, sir, I think it would be, it would be useful. Deputy Alves. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Will the candidate com commit to ensuring that the excellent work that has commenced and is in train with the International Cultural Centre, currently overseen by the Education Minister and as a result of the pri priorities from the Diversity Forum Legacy Report, uh, will continue and be supported in the same way should he be elected? Thank you, sir. Uh, again, sir, I don't know as much as I perhaps should about that, but I do make that commitment, sir, and would look forward to learning a lot more about it, whether I'm elected or not, sir. Thank you. Supplemental, Deputy Alves. Deputy Renov. Yes, sir. Uh, the States is due to debate uh, P82 2023 on offshore wind in March. Will the candidate be supporting this proposition? I'm not sure, sir. I have to... Um, uh, my, my own view, sir, uh, is that the most reliable um, uh, type of renewable energy for us has to be tidal related in some way. And that's a debate I look forward to having with the deputy at some time. And I respect his, his knowledge on environmental energy options, sir. Um, so the short answer is I, I don't know. I support renewable energy. I might well support it, but I certainly expect us to look at uh, uh, making doing a lot more research into whether we can get similar benefits from using our tidal movements, uh, which I think is much more reliable because we can predict to the nearest inch or two, sir, how much our tide is going to come in, in out every single, twice a day, every single day of the week of the year, sir. Much more reliable. Supplemental question, then? Yes, sir. Does he not accept the evidence that was put forward in the report, the, prop, the uh, report accompanying the proposition P82, that at the moment uh, tidal power is nowhere near as economic as offshore wind, uh, and that the industry is telling us that they are very supportive of offshore wind? They think we have an ex incredible opportunity in terms of the wind regime and the shallowness of waters and access to markets. And would he be prepared to rethink his caution on that and perhaps seize an opportunity that might lie for the island in the future? Absolutely, sir. It's important that we all are open to compromise. Thank you. Colin Tubbs and John. Uh, thank you, sir. So the candidate mentioned the teacher's pay dispute in his speech, so I would like to ask, what would the candidate do to find a resolution to the ongoing teacher's pay dispute? Uh, 
we have to be closer. I believe both sides really want to settle this. Um, so we can't be too far apart. Um, I think we need to uh, show a, a, a little bit more respect to our teaching uh, uh, profession. I, I'm not sure that sending them a letter with an ultimatum was a, was a good idea. I'm not sure. What, whilst I know, I, I understand the, the challenges around, around the, the, the unions, I'm, I'm not sure that was helpful. Um, but I think we're going to have to, um, everybody's going to have to sit around the table and, and find that middle ground. We, we've got to be close. So let's just um, try and find that common ground so and get it over the line. Find, we've got to find a solution. There's a solution somewhere, sir. Supplemental question. Uh, <clears throat> Deputy Miller. Thank you, sir. Um, the financial services industry is the engine room of our economy and produces a significant amount of the government income which funds public services. What would the candidate do to protect and promote it and ensure its continued success? Um, I would, I think, continue to do what, what we've been doing over the years. Uh, uh, sir. Um, I also um, know about the amount of work that's been done by the industry and regulators in preparation to the recent money work fail, uh, uh, a visit, uh, which has um, demonstrated what a well-run, well-regulated industry uh, we have. And I believe, sir, we've given the best possible uh, uh, account of ourselves um, because of the strengths of our industry. And uh, I will do everything I can to ensure that continues, sir. And I'm um, uh, uh, rightly, I think, proud of the industry that is so important to our economy and eagerly await the results of the Money Vale, Money vale visit, which I believe, sir, will be positive because I have faith in the industry. <coughs> Supplemental question, Deputy Miller. Thank you, sir. Uh, we saw yesterday the relaunch, rebrand of Guernsey's representative industry as Guernsey Finance. And we know that other jurisdictions have similar bodies to promote uh, their financial services industries. Will he support, will the candidates support Jersey Finance continuing in its role as promoting and representing our financial services industry? I always have supported Jersey Finance, sir, and I see no reason why I shouldn't. Unless there's a googly in there somewhere that the deputy knows about that I don't, sir. I'd be pleased to continue to support Jersey Finance, sir. And as part of the uh, review of ALO, sir, I think there's an opportunity to support them even more. Deputy Catherine Curtis. Thank you, sir. Um, I asked this question to the previous candidate, too. Uh, the cuts made by the government in Amendment 33 of the government plan included a cut of £47,000 to the police budget. Um, nearly all of the police budget is staffing, so that could mean fewer police officers. The cuts proposed for children, young people, education and skills budget was £286,000. These cuts were on top of the planned value for money savings. Will the deputy look to reverse cuts to essential services if he becomes chief minister? I think that, yes, sir, I think the short answer is to that is yes, but it's got to be part of a bigger uh, piece of work about reprioritizing how we direct um, uh, spending, sir. I think we need to put, we've got four, basically four layers to the public sector. We've got our frontline services, then we've got public services and infrastructure, then we've got our, our, our corporate um, functions, uh, which includes IT and HR and Treasury, and then we have uh, uh, quite a large layer of policy. Uh, and I think we need to look very closely to make sure we're getting value for money from those higher uh, uh, levels, and whether we need them, and redirecting any savings that we can make there or any, um, any uh, yeah, drive out any savings and, and put that to the front line. And I think the, poli the, the examples that the deputy raised uh, are, are good examples especially in, in relation to the police for the police uh, and the 
uh, retaining of, of, of law and order. I think I was not uh, in favour. I was very and remain concerned about the cuts, the potential cuts to frontline policing that will be a consequence of the previous government plan. Supplemental question, Deputy. Deputy Miles. Thank you, sir. Can the Deputy tell us some more about his leadership ability and how he plans to deliver within a council where there seems to be so much need to compromise? Um, again, sir, it's, it's about consensus. It's about courtesy. I'm sorry, sir. It, it's about... Um, it, it, I, I've, I think it's largely about uh, respect so, and professionalism uh, and courtesy and being prepared uh, uh, to compromise. So I think any, any member of this assembly that I've worked closely with, I can't, I, I can't remember falling out. We've had a few cross words here and there with anybody. So I think people will know and realize my style it, it is, is about working together and always trying to find a solution. I haven't been fortunate enough to work with many of the new members and I, and I regret that, sir, but I, I would like the opportunity to. The Home Affairs Minister very, uh, uh, very uh, kindly, sir, appointed me to the Jersey Police Authority, uh, and, uh, and I hope my work there has, has been uh, welcome. I certainly have enjoyed uh, doing it, sir, and I, I can only um, uh, say that I, can, I, I aim to continue how I've, I've worked in the past, sir, and um, just try and, and heal the differences and remember why we are all in here, remember what we're working for, sir, and put, actually, people of Jersey before our own passionate feelings at times. <clears throat> Supplemental question, Deputy. Uh, yes, please, sir. I mean, the, the question asked how the, the um, deputy would deliver, given the need to effect so much compromise in a diverse council. Well, that's a, a really a broad uh, sort of question. So I thought I'd, I'd answer that. To get to deliver, so I'm not sure deliver what, um, but to deliver um, success from a government. We have to work together. And to work together, we have to show each other a bit of courtesy, respect, and professionalism, sir. Uh, and I think my style of management would ensure that that is maintained through government processes. And I would expect members to subscribe to that. <clears throat> there is uh, less uh, now than 20 seconds left. And therefore, I won't call upon anyone else to uh, ask any further questions. And that concludes the time available. Uh, for questions to this candidate. Uh, accordingly, uh, I would ask that uh, Deputy uh, Farnham uh, leave the chamber and Deputy Mezek be brought back in. Sir, may yeah. I propose the adjournment, sir? It's uh, a natural break in proceedings uh, to allow the uh, ca next candidate to uh, not only give his speech but also to answer questions rather than break in the middle of his questions, sir. Well, um, the, the only observations I might make before anyone else makes observations is that that would mean that the remaining candidate would need to remain sequestered until after the luncheon adjournment, so for several hours, um, and, and that would also, um, which, which may be unnecessary in the proceedings, I would suggest that what happens is, um, I think it must be right that one would not wish to see a break in the questioning. So I think it might be now for the Assembly to consider whether it will continue into the lunch hour, at least to, even if it doesn't vote, at least for the purposes of dealing with um, this matter. Uh, if you wish to make a proposition in the sense you have, but it may be there's a better proposition to be made, if I can say so. I withdraw my proposition, sir. Sir, may I propose that we uh, carry on to at least five past one or uh, the conclusion of questions for Deputy Mizek? And then yes. break for lunch. So the proposition is con we continue till conclusions of Deputy Bezek. Um, is that proposition seconded? Yes, sir. So does any member wish to speak on the proposition? Chair of PPC. Um, I'd, I'd like to make another proposition just to say that we stay here until we finish. Um, it's, it's a matter for you, Conto. You can withdraw that proposition that you made, otherwise we will have to vote upon it. Um, well, the, the, the actual voting may go on for some time, sir, but uh, it would be, it, well, if, if members feel they could complete, then I'm prepared to withdraw, sir, and we'll go through. So, Chair of BBC, are you proposing that we continue till we finish? Yes. 
I think that would be fair on all candidates and the uh, Assembly. Is that seconded? Yes. yes. Does any member wish to speak? So it's just an observation. I, I think some of the reason it might have been moved is that, that some of the more disciplined members who have remained in their seat all this time may not realise that they can, they, that, or may think they need to get up for a comfort break, that's all. And um, I might be in that position, although I'm not one of the disciplined members who's been in their seat. But, um, so, so if members are going out, it's probably because of that, <coughs> not because of any discourtesy to the candidates. So I think that's the point. Well, I think... Um... Does any other member wish to speak on that proposition? Those in favour of adopting, kindly show. Those against? Very well, we continue uh, until we finish, uh, notwithstanding the fact it eats into the lunch hour. Yes, uh, Deputy Mezek, you now have uh, up to 10 minutes to speak uh, to the Assembly, followed which I'm sure you will know there will be up to an hour of questioning posed to you. Deputy. Thank you, sir. Um, I want to start by publicly reiterating the words of thanks that I have privately expressed to the outgoing Chief Minister, Deputy Moore, and recognise her leadership over the last 18 months, serving Jersey through difficult times and remaining committed to the island, which we are all so lucky to call home. Anyone who's prepared to do that is deserving of our gratitude. So last week, the States Assembly made a historic decision when, for the first time ever, we chose to democratically remove a government midterm and provide an opportunity for new leadership to take the <coughs> island forward. Rather than bury our heads in the sand, allow mistakes to continue to be made, and watch as the public grew more and more discontented, we chose to take the first step towards fixing those problems. Today is about taking the second step, a step forwards, not backwards to where we started. In making my pitch for Chief Minister, I must start by saying that the decision that we made last week was the right decision. It was undoubtedly an unpleasant experience to go through, but it was a necessary one and one which we must learn the lessons from, lest we are doomed to repeat them all over again. The outgoing, uh, the outgoing government started its, its term with nice words and rhetoric about effective collaboration, good communication and compassion. But none of these things ever really materialised. The government was never collaborative or inclusive, it was exclusive. The communication was pretty terrible at times, and often decisions were made which appeared to totally lack compassion. The optimism that many felt at the start of the term of office was well and truly extinguished by last year when the nice words would no longer cut it. Words are inconsequential if they don't match the outcomes. With growing inequality, record levels of food bank usage, and hundreds of locally qualified islanders leaving Jersey every year to seek better lives elsewhere, it is vital that we use this moment to reset and get Jersey back on track. Now is not the time to preserve the status quo. And to those who say we need stability now, I say that it doesn't matter how steady your hand is on the tiller if you're sailing the ship towards an iceberg. So I'm running for Chief Minister because I have the vision, the skills, and most importantly, the plan to steer Jersey away from the terminal <coughs> decline that successive Conservative-led governments have taken us to the brink of. I've shown through my leadership of Reform Jersey, my roles as a senior scrutineer and a former government minister, that I'm a competent leader who can bring people together and deliver the kind of politics that islanders deserve. For Jersey's government, my platform can be summed up with these simple words, social and economic justice. I believe in an island society that works for everyone, rather than one that caters to the rich and powerful and expects the wealth to magically trickle down. I believe in an island society that values the things that are unquantifiable, like our collective well-being and happiness as a community and our natural environment. 
I believe in an island society where no one is denied the opportunity to achieve their potential because of their background. And these political convictions are fundamental to my leadership and would guide how a government I lead governs the island. In my vision statement, I've outlined what my three short-term priorities will be if I'm elected Chief Minister. So the first of those is to resolve Jersey's housing crisis. I make this commitment that on day one of a mesec led government, we will issue an official declaration that Jersey has a housing crisis and we will establish an emergency task force to drive forward the implementation of our housing crisis action plan, which despite 18 months of prevarication, consultation and review by the outgoing government, remains the only coherent and credible plan on offer. <coughs> Jersey's young people are telling us that it's the cost of housing that is largely to blame for causing so many of them to lose hope that they can have a prosperous future here. And our statisticians are telling us that the cost of housing is the biggest contributor to causing people to live in relative poverty. We cannot sit around and wait for a few drains to be installed and the supply of homes to increase and expect everything to magically fall into place whilst we pat ourselves on the back in the meantime. We must go further and we must introduce rent control and ramp up schemes to support islanders into home ownership. Secondly, I'm determined that Jersey can and must play its part in responding to the climate crisis, but we must do so in line with the principles of a just transition with common sense proposals that are to the benefit of working people. The carbon neutral agenda ought to be an exciting chance to improve our quality of life, clean up the island and exploit the economic opportunities that come with it. But I am deeply concerned, as we're going now, we are losing public support for this cause and risking turning it into another culture war. This is in part due to the approach that we've had so far, where taxpayers' money has been funneled into schemes which disproportionately benefit the affluent to support them receiving grants for things they either don't need or could afford on their own anyway. As Chief Minister, I would bring together the leaders of Jersey's financial services industry to set up a plan for becoming a green finance centre. We have the talent and the expertise to use this industry to play a positive role in the world as others look to fund their own journeys to carbon neutrality whilst raising the funds to pay for our own transition here. And thirdly, sir, we must restore faith and confidence in our government system. It is clear that the reforms to our government system which were spearheaded by the Chief Minister of 2011 to 2018, have not worked. We've put too much power in the hands of too few people, many of whom are not elected. The creation of the Cabinet Office has achieved the exact opposite of what it was meant to, and it seems like the more we spend on communications, the worse communications get. The next Chief Minister, must reconnect the government with the public. Ministers should be responsible for their own communications. Democratically elected people must be in charge and we must repeal the laws that have concentrated powers in the hands of the unaccountable. And sir, we must pay greater heed to scrutiny. There has been some seriously good work done in this term, including the work permit panels report and the overpayments review which were rejected by the outgoing government. The new government must not have such a dismissive attitude to scrutiny and to this assembly as a whole. So as well as those short-term aims, there is so much more that needs to be done to secure our long-term prosperity for our community. And we can only do this by working together. But it feels like the winds of change are blowing. It won't have escaped members' attention that the vast majority of email correspondence we've received in the run-up to today has been in support of my candidacy. And a recent JP poll 
had me as the public's preferred candidate with over 50% of the vote. Reform Jersey is receiving accolades from places we never received them before, and our support in the country parishes is growing too. I believe that this is because our block of 20% in this assembly has demonstrated political dignity, unity, and clarity of purpose where the outgoing government did not. So we are willing and ready to serve, to put our talents and expertise to good use for the benefit of the public. All we ask for is that opportunity. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> there is now a period of an hour for uh, questions to um, Deputy Mezek for up to an hour. And uh, the first one is Deputy Southern. Thank you, sir. And I uh, ask the same question as I asked the two previous candidates. Um, in this, this case, in the context of the use of the word compassionate, Compassion. And it is this, um, how did the candidate vote uh, on P113 back in 2018, which involved the reinstatement of single parent component and income support, uh, the worst off in our society? So not only did I vote in favour of the proposition to reinstate the single parent component, but I actually lodged an amendment to the medium term financial plan to prevent it being abolished in the first place. And I regarded the loss of that amendment and several others that day as one of the worst days I experienced in this state's assembly, because that assembly, led by a previous chief minister, inflicted £10 million of cuts to the support for some of the most vulnerable people in our society, despite the statistical evidence we had that showed that some of those groups were those most at risk of living in relative poverty. Um, so I think poverty is a mark of shame on our wealthy island, and I would simply not stand as a politician or a chief minister with any kind of complacency that we allow poverty to continue to get worse in Jersey. And that is why I voted strongly in favour of that proposition when it was brought. Supplemental question, Deputy Southern? No, sir. Thank you. Colin Tarbis and Saviour. Thank you, sir. And uh, I too will ask the same question, sir, of all candidates. Uh, shipping up 19%, freight service, gas, electricity, fuel, all gone up. <coughs> Prices going up at least 12%. Food, housing costs, astronomical. Uh, Jersey, I read, is the eighth most expensive place in the world to live. What would the candidate do to ease the burden on young families and pensioners in Jersey? Thanks, sir. Um, thank you, sir, and I thank the constable for this question. I, th I think we're due relatively soon to see the next RPI figures and the breakdown of that, which will give us a bit more clarity on e exactly where those pressure points are. But sir, we already have the stats to know that it's the cost of housing that is the biggest, um, uh, that causes the biggest impact on people's uh, cost of living expenses, rent and inflation and the cost of mortgages going up uh, as well. And it's the biggest contributor for causing people to live uh, in relative poverty. I don't think we can underestimate the impact that it would have by having a focus on that particular inflationary cost to people's household budgets and what that would enable people to do with their remaining income to support uh, themselves with other costs going up. Uh, so it's also not any secret that I have never agreed with taxing the essentials in life, especially food. I think that's something that we ought to revisit. And I know that there are supermarkets in Jersey that are keen to be partners in that to see what they can do. Um, but what's a, a strategy that is not um, enough is what we've had up until this point, which is I think every time we've seen costs go up, we've just increased benefits. And I think that's a sticking plaster on an open wound. We have to deal with these things at source because there is only so much ability we have to tax the working population, to fund extra welfare um, for everybody else who is struggling. That, that, that is an unsustainable position, though it's the right thing to do 
um, in the short term. That's why I'm so supportive of the living wage campaign and other things like that, which I think would get to the root of the problem. Supplemental question, Conitar. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that the Parish of St Saviour has a living wage accreditation. <coughs> so the, um, further to the candidate's reply, sir, uh, there are many, many people having to use food banks. Does the candidate believe that in this day and age, in a relatively wealthy island such as Jersey, that this is unacceptable? Is that uh, no, sir. It's a mark of shame on the islands that food bank usage has gone up to the levels it has. And I think we ought to respect and listen to the testimony that those who run our food banks give us. And I think the comments that we've received from some of them about the conditions that are causing people to have to rely on that service uh, must be listened to. Um, but it's also so evident that the strategy up until this point hasn't worked. Um, OK, we've done good and necessary things like expand the community costs bonus, like raise income support components, etc. But that's happened whilst food bank usage has gone up. That is a sign that that strategy doesn't work and why we need to do, as I said before, and look at the root causes of this and not simply just throw money at a problem and expect that to solve everything because the evidence shows it hasn't. So, may I, may I clarify? I'm not sure if the, um, well, the candidate you... understood the question as asked. I was implying that it, it was um, the fact that people have to use the food bank, not the fact that they are using it. Well, I think the, the deputy said, yes, it was unacceptable. Um, he agreed with your proposition. I think that has been answered. Deputy Catherine Curtis. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> the cuts made by the government in Amendment 33 of the government plan included a cut of £47,000 for the police budget. Nearly all the police budget is staffing, so that could mean fewer police officers. The cuts proposed for the children, young people, education and skills budget was £286,000. These cuts were on top of the planned value for money savings. Will the deputy look to reverse cuts to essential services if he becomes chief minister? Um, so there should be no cuts to essential services. The clue is in the name, they're essential. Uh, so they should not be the target uh, of cuts. Um, I've expressed great concern over the value for money program that has been proposed by the government because I think that um, it has, uh, that they haven't provided the evidence that it's been targeted on the basis of any clear thought out plan to actually ensure that they are efficiencies and not cuts. And I worry that the future projections of uh, targets that are put on government <coughs> departments uh, could lead to panicking in departments when they're not able to find genuine efficiencies. And that turns into pressure then to put them, uh, to turn them into cuts. Um, I, I don't understand um, how targets can be come up with for services like the um, police force, like um, children, young people, education and skills, without telling us what that actually means. And in the recent government plan, when an amendment was approved that had extra value for money savings provided for, um, they had one <laughs> sentence in the report justifying what that actually was. I don't think we can have confidence with one sentence that that was thought out properly. And, you know, I am all in favour of departments being efficient and getting best use out of uh, taxpayers' money, but uh, I, I'm not in favour of putting your finger in the air and seeing which way the wind is blowing and just going for that, which uh, I think the exercise has not been scientific up until this point. Uh, supplemental question? Deputy War. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the candidate uh, proposed his manifesto, and I'm pleased to hear him reiterate this point about rent control. Um, we, in, in the uh, manifesto document, uh, the pledges include rent freezes, making open-ended tenancies the default, and taxing empty properties. So are these red lines that uh, the, de the, de the uh, candidate uh, could not cross? Um, yes, sir, I believe in respecting your manifesto commitments. Supplemental question, Deputy Ward. Thank you, sir. Um, I understand uh, that in, all, uh, in a previous uh, candidate's uh, answer, he talked about the word compromise. 
um, and suggested that uh, if he needed to work with the Reform Party, uh, he would expect a compromise. So presumably he's not going to get any in these areas. I'm not entirely sure the deputy had my previous answer, sir. His question was about those specific ones. Those are red lines, but that doesn't mean everything is a red line, and there are other things that you can look at. But those ones are red lines because the housing crisis is so dire. Thank you. Uh, deputy Gardner. Interested. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for clarity, and I re do respect really clear what are the red lines, what are not. And... Last time, Deputy Mezek, Senator Mezek, was, uh, Senator Mezek resigned from the Council of Ministers because the policies that he believed in couldn't progress. If candidate is successful, uh, we have 10 members of the reform that definitely will be members of the Council of Ministers, but to make executive to make executive, you would need to invite at least, if not more, 11 other members. Based on the government plan debate that most of the amendments were rejected, I would like to ask Deputy what flexibility, what compromises he will be ready to accept from his manifesto to other people join the government. Um, thank you, sir. And the uh, deputy is right that there were some amendments that were brought which were uh, accepted. Uh, so I'm content to say that when it's come to our uh, income tax policy, we've given that a good go in this assembly and we're probably not going to get it over the line until we have a majority government. So I think that there's, there's probably not a lot of point in spending more time on that. We've already fulfilled our manifesto commitment by at least trying on it. But, you know, I, I can see that the writing's on the wall for that in this term of office, so it's probably not worth spending that much more time on it. Thank you, Deputy. It's really helpful. Um, Follow-up question. If the can if potential candidate to the government not accepting rent control, as an example, uh, this is red line, would he be or she invited into the government? Um, so, as Housing Minister, no. That will be very clear because uh, I am so determined that we need to respond to the housing crisis. But, sir, uh, I'm accepting that in whatever new government there is, it will be a coalition and it will include independent members uh, who are not necessarily aligned with my politics. I think we make a grave mistake when we boast the virtues of having a system of independence and then don't let those people behave like independents when they go into government. I think that's hypocritical, actually. Um, so so I, I would expect members to um, refer to their, man their manifestos. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, sir, I think that's healthy because if we are prepared as ministers to sit around a table and be open and honest with one another about what we disagree on and not guilt trip other members into voting for things that they are staunchly opposed to, then what that ends up doing is it defers that to this assembly to be the decision-making body, and I, sir, would not wield a whip against ministers to make them vote against things that they felt so strongly uh, against. Deputy Ferry. Thank you, sir. And my question to the candidate is about minimum wage. And um, over the last two years, we've had substantial increases in our minimum wage now placing us above Guernsey and the UK. Will the candidate explain how he will achieve realistic increases in the minimum wage going forward, sir? Um, so we already have a target of setting the minimum wage at uh, two-thirds of median earnings, and I say we crack on with it. Supplemental, Deputy Ferry? Yes, sir. Deputy Miller. Thank you, sir. The financial services industry is the engine room of our economy and it produces a significant amount of government income which funds public services. What would the candidate do to protect and promote it and ensure its continued success? Um, sir, I desperately want Jersey to continue to have a thriving finance industry. I want it to be employing lots of people, paying them good salaries and paying tax, which we use to fund our public services, and I make no bones about that. So in the short term, it's absolutely vital that we uh, engage with the money val assessment and make sure that we come out of that with a very, clear, a very clean 
bill of health. Um, but, sir, looking beyond that, I mentioned in my um, opening remarks how uh, enthusiastic I am about trying to develop more of a green finance industry. Um, I met uh, not that long ago with uh, the leadership of Jersey Finance, who very kindly introduced me to some of their members to talk about the prospects that there are for developing the green finance industry here. Uh, they produced an extremely good report on this, which I actually don't understand why we haven't been boasting about uh, a bit more, to be honest, because there is a great opportunity there as other jurisdictions and businesses are seeking to, um, uh, to improve their own environmental credentials, that they'll need good financial advice, they'll need to set structures up to help fund some of that, and we're one of the best places in the world to help those people. So I think that ought to be something that we promote and shout from the rooftop, because not only is it good for the world, it's also good for Jersey and good for our own public funds as well. Supplemental? Uh, yes, yeah, same question as asked other candidates, sir. Um, we recently saw, yesterday, we saw Guernsey Finance relaunching and rebranding. Um, other finance centres have similar representative bodies. Will, he, will the candidate support the work of Jersey Finance in a, as a promotional and representative body for our industry? Uh, yes, sir, absolutely. Um, when I was a member of the Housing and Work Advisory Group, we used to meet with the leadership of Jersey Finance very frequently, who gave us very helpful updates on things like their own employment statistics and some of the issues they thought they were um, facing. I thought I had a, a good relationship with them when that was happening, uh, and I'm very keen to maintain that. Connick Tarpers and Brillard. Given recent storms, pandemics and global events, would the candidate advise members how he might ensure the island is resilient to future events and without empty supermarkets in periods of heavy weather? Thank you, sir. And thank you, sir. And, and uh, the constable will know um, of the um, uh, worries that we've heard from some very experienced uh, people uh, in the in the realms of logistics, who I, th I think have expressed concerns uh, to him and also to me as well about Jersey's um, preparedness for eventualities like that, if for whatever reason ferries can't um, come in or, or other things, or if, if there's more global turmoil any more than we've got already. Um, so I think that having some form of resilient strategy in place is something we need to give serious consideration to, uh, and I would be very keen to... Um, work with uh, those in our island community who are at the forefront of this, those who run the supermarkets, those who've got um, experience with um, uh, logistics and shipping to talk about how we can um, have something in place as soon as possible because at the end of the day we've got absolutely no idea what's heading around the corner and it wouldn't actually take that long for things to get very bad here if we weren't able to import fuel or food or all of those things. Supplementary. Uh, would the candidate be reviewing uh, our southern trade route and how it can be enhanced to in, in reinforce our resilience? Uh, indeed, so I know that there's, um, uh, there's talks at the moment about our uh, freight links and uh, passenger services as well for that matter, and that ought to definitely be part of that conversation. Um, obviously, the UK is our closest um, political and economic partner, but it's not our closest geographic partner. And having as good relations as we possibly can with our French neighbours um, and, and build upon that friendship to ensure we've got ties there if the ties we have elsewhere um, aren't able to be used is absolutely vital to our um, well-being in the event that we hit another crisis. Deputy Kovac. Thank you, sir. I'm also repeating the question uh, as for the other candidates. Uh, whilst um, there's an ongoing safety assessment uh, for um, Fort Regent, we already know that the main parts uh, are safe enough, like the roof and the main hall. Uh, given all this, uh, what immediate action uh, would the candidate take uh, to put the Fort Regent back in full use as soon as possible if elected? Well, um, thank you, sir. And with, obviously, the vaccination centre uh, moving out from there as well, that probably provides us with a good opportunity to look at what can be used there. Um, the fort isn't actually empty. There is still stuff uh, going on there, despite lots of the uh, facilities there being moved to other places too. Uh, it seems a total waste to have a facility um, that, you know, provided that it is um, safe and usable, not being put to good use. 
Um, that's something that time and time again we see with government-owned property and things being uh, left to decay, which ends up making them cost more in the long run to get back up to use as well. So, so now that that opportunity has presented itself uh, with the vaccination centre moving, um, then that should, I, I hope, provide an opportunity to look at what short-term use we could get for that whilst we develop a longer-term plan for Fort Regent. Supplemental question, Deputy? Thank you. Uh, what does the candidate see as the future plan for Fort Regent? Um, th this is something that um, every term of office that I've uh, been in the States, the government seems to come up with a new plan for Fort Regent towards the end of its term and then immediately forgets about it um, after the election. I think I might have even seen like three iterations of that. Um, so I, I think we don't have a good record at managing that particular facility. And so I don't really think that uh, the government is well placed to come up with bright ideas that in, in actual fact turn out to be unrealistic or don't really have the buy-in of the public. I think that if we're to get the best use of Fort Regent, that will probably involve a, a lot more engagement with the private sector who might see some really good opportunities to station some activities up there. And that being said though, whatever arrangement that would be would absolutely be a partnership between government and private sector. I'm, I'm not somebody that wants to sell off um, facilities like that, which uh, I think would be terrible for the island. Thank you, sir. And I too will ask the same question uh, of uh, somebody I spoke to at the weekend, a young gentleman who um, is about to move from a £900 rental uh, home uh, in, and the only property, uh, home he's confined costs £1,100 plus £1,000 for a deposit plus £175 for fees for the agency. Uh, can I ask the candidate, sir, uh, what is the action that can be taken to stop these young people who have done everything right, are working and paying their taxes, leaving this island because of the high cost of living that they're facing day in, day out? Thank you, sir. Uh, so for a start, we should not be using government land to build small, cramped, one-bedroom properties that end up getting rented out at uh, rental stress levels. Uh, we've seen this on far too many occasions and I think it's a very sad thing that when we look at the Horizon development where every single one bedroom flat there does not meet the minimum space standards for a couple to live in them but many of them are being rented out at levels you wouldn't be able to afford unless you had two incomes uh, to be able to do that. So for a start sir that ends immediately and our own government developers will not be um, uh, building projects where that is destined to be their future. Um, I too, when I work with constituents and look at uh, draft tenancies that they sometimes present to me, see clauses in them that are not justifiable. Uh, I've seen clauses um, that stipulate arbitrary fees for getting professional cleaners in at the end of a tenancy, which is um, what the deposit's meant to be for, and it's a way of getting around my deposits, being able to arbitrate on that and profiteering out of somebody getting a professional cleaner rather than judging whether they've actually cleaned up the place properly itself. Um, I see things like that far too often and I think a new residential tenancy law has got to deal with some of the arbitrary fees that are put on tenants that have no correspondence whatsoever to the work that the letting agent um, actually does and just seem to me to be exploitative. Supplemental question, Deputy. Yes, so one of them was on contracts, one of those exact details that I've asked the other two candidates, but I will ask, there's another clause in one of the, can the contracts that I've seen, in fact, more than one, sir, whereby if you were to break the contract within the year, you have to find another tenant, plus you pay, I think it was ranging up to £750 uh, to deal with trans transferring that tenancy. Would the candidates, sir, do something about this really unfair charge, uh, which I, I don't even know how it's legal, sir. Thank you. Um, yes, sir, and I'm, I'm aware of instances of people who have had to leave a property before the tenancy was up because of the personal situations they found. In, in, in one instance, it was somebody who'd had a child, and so the property that property became unsuitable, uh, who was charged hundreds of pounds to assign the tenancy to someone new. And in that instance, this tenant found the new person help them do all the checks. That person was actually going to have a higher rent when they took up a new tenancy. And the um, letting agent and landlord had done nothing 
apart from pass on a massive arbitrary charge that actually um, caused hardship to somebody who was about to become a single parent who could have done with keeping that money to support their uh, newborn child. Again, that kind of thing is exploitative and I think that there needs to be much tougher rules about what fees can be charged to tenants in those situations. In that instance, all the letting agent had to do was print off a new tenancy form with a different name on it and they charged hundreds and hundreds of pounds for that, which is clearly outrageous. Dr. Tony. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the candidate is in his 10th year of politics now, and I think he needs to be congratulated for the way in which he has um, engaged publicly uh, with politics when there's been a, an otherwise general trend away from uh, interest in politics. Um, to, to maybe uh, reference uh, President Obama, who, who talked about the politics of hope, there, there seem to be quite a lot of in, people in Jersey in sections who have lost hope uh, in the island. Does the uh, candidate still believe in the politics of hope? And what is his, his um, high-level vision for, uh, for Jersey and for restoring that hope? Um, thank you, sir. Ten years, boy, it's flown by, hasn't it? Um, and I've not changed at all in that time, have I? Yeah. Um, sir, um, I, today I find myself um, with uh, no, no diminishing whatsoever of my determination and that fire I feel inside of me to make Jersey a better place to live for everyone, but crucially to make our politics work for everyone. Um, I think that um, by moving away from the unpleasant personality politics, the broken electoral system and other elements of our government system that need um, to be changed, we can convince more and more islanders that politics is something that can have an impact on their lives. I just take one small example I found recently. I, I was at my constituency surgery and a gentleman walked past the cafe and just happened to see me, so he came in to talk and he said, um, did you know that the pensioner's Christmas bonus hasn't been raised in seven years? And I said, oh no, I hadn't realised, thanks for telling me that, I'll give that a think, which we did and then within months, uh, us uh, Deputy Ward uh, took on that one, had it passed had it implemented, and I then remember bumping into this gentleman again in the street who said, I couldn't believe it, a politician listened and actually did something about it. And I hope by um, highlighting those kinds of examples, we can teach uh, people that it really is worth engaging with the political system um, and things aren't as bad as often people may feel. Supplemental uh, question, Deputy? Uh, Deputy Hegron. Thank you, sir. How will the deputy deal with conflict in his team, should he be chief minister? Well, sir, point number one, sir, is that if you are to take up a role in government, you should know that it is an implicit and non-negotiable condition that you are to respect one another on a personal level in doing that job, notwithstanding any political disagreements that you may have. Um, when I've served as a minister, and in fact in all of my professional life, I have had two uh, principles uh, one is you never raise your voice at people. You, you are perfectly capable of speaking firmly and holding people to account without shouting at them and never swear at them either. Um, I believe that is unnecessary um, too. Uh, I would expect that anybody who served in the government lived up to those principles and were there instances where they didn't live up to those principles, um, they would find themselves very quickly in my office receiving some very... Uh, calm and reasonable volued words, but words that I hope would get across the impression to them that that was unacceptable. Supplemental question, Deputy? Yes, thank you, sir. Could the Deputy actually give an example when that, that has actually happened? Thank you. Uh, could you clarify in what kind of context? Yeah, where you've actually had to deal with conflict between two people, if you can give an example, obviously not with any names. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I'm very lucky that the team I lead is so united on uh, political principles, but uh, the one thing that, that sometimes can cause tension is tactical discussions, deciding strategy as opposed to deciding principle. And I think that I can demonstrate that I've been an effective leader in bringing people together, making them feel, even if they may have you know, the occasional reservation about a strategy um, or a tactic, but a belief that the ultimate goal is worth it and unity means we can be so much more effective and deliver more. And that has been, uh, I think, a constant throughout the entirety of my time in politics. Uh, thank you, sir. In my Christmas speech on behalf of the Connie Tubbs, um, members may no have noted I departed from tradition in wishing the 
States of Deliberation Guernsey, a very happy Christmas. And I'd be interested in hearing what uh, plans the Deputy would have if Chief Minister to work more collaboratively with our sister island. Thank you, sir. Um, absolutely so. And of course, the um, uh, well, firstly, we can learn from the experience of our sister island, uh, who have themselves have also just gone through a, um, a, uh, a vote of no confidence and replacing them with a, a chief minister. Although in this instance, I hope we'll pick a Sam rather than a Lyndon or, or an Ian. Um, but, sir, um, there is lots that can be done to work with Guernsey. I, I think that um, the kind of what feels like a more ad hoc uh, collaboration with them probably ought to be formalised a bit more and I think that our islands could probably do with having a more formal agreement in place that puts a structure, you know, some Channel Islands Council of some form where there is constant dialogue, not just at political level but officer level too. Uh, when we look at some of the shared challenges we face, recruitment in our public services being one, I wonder if there are opportunities we could have when it comes to kind of specialist services, health being a great example there, where maybe our health departments could jointly employ people where maybe there wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be cost effective for one island to employ that person, but for both of them to share them to provide that service, that could be a really good opportunity to, um, uh, to I think, get better use of funding there. The other, the other point I'll make, sir, is that I have to say that I have a great deal of sympathy with our sister islands, Alderney and Sark, which I think are often left out of this discussion, and I would desperately like to see much closer connections with them, and in particularly um, Alderney, who I think have their own economic difficulties, part of which comes from isolation, and as a Channel Islands family, we should be working much more closely with them as well. Supplementary question? Colin Jobson, John. <coughs> Uh, thank you, sir. So what would the candidate do to find a resolution to the ongoing current teacher's pay dispute? Um, well, firstly, sir, I would um, revoke the letter that was sent to them a couple of Fridays ago, which I think sent out all of the wrong messages to them and I think was authorita authoritarian in its nature by asking essentially to compile a database of how people voted in a private ballot. I think that was a disrespectful thing um, to do to them. Um, so the teachers are not our enemies. They're our partners for delivering an education system to our young people who are our future. So we are shooting ourselves in the foot if we continue to treat them with disrespect. Um, so I think that um, uh, we have very good relations with the teachers' representatives. In particular, to my left is sat a, a former a union leader for teachers who maintains a very good rapport with them. I would hope that the new government would be able to press that reset button on relationships with them, sit down with them and say, right, okay, we're approaching this now as your friends and partners, not as your enemy. What will it take to have you feel comfortable that you have a good um, future in teaching in Jersey? Uh, and what is a reasonable thing that the government can offer them to end that dispute and look towards the, the long-term challenges that education has beyond this initial pay deal? Supplemental question. Deputy Scott. Thank you, sir. Um, in addition to your, uh, sorry, in addition to the candidate's comments regarding um, liaising with um, Guernsey, could the um, candidate please <clears throat> confirm whether he's committed to, to achieving value for money for taxpayers and how his approach would differ from the current government? Um, thank you, sir, and thank, uh, thank uh, Deputy Scott for her question as well. Um, so one of the uh, advantages of having clearer political policies is that it enables you to save a huge amount of time and money on consultations which sometimes serve the purpose of delaying decisions from being made or putting off difficult decisions and because they may end up being um, unpopular. And I, I think I've seen examples in the past of, co of consultants being commissioned to help the government with something uh, and they end up coming up actually with half the solution and say you'll have to commission us again for the other half uh, of that solution. Um, the benefit of having clearer political policies is that if you're going to consult, it will be, I think, more on the fine detail or with a targeted approach to stakeholders rather than paying people a fortune to tell you things that you probably ought to have known from the start. Supplemental question, Deputy Scott. 
Yes, please, sir. Um, which of the controller and auditor general's um, recommendations to achieve value for money do you think is the most important to implement um, in terms of priority and when we, might you do it? Thank you, sir. I haven't a clue. That's my joker card there. I'll have to look at them and come back to her on that one. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, sir. Following from recent reports published regarding the persistent high gender pay disparities in Jersey, especially in the finance sector and even within the government, what policies and initiatives would the candidate pursue to encourage more parity in the workplace? Um, thank you, sir. I, I served on the gender pay gap uh, review panel in the previous term uh, of office, and I um, helped um, follow up with that in this term of office when all of my colleagues from that panel ended up uh, in government. Um, I, I think that there is good scope for having some form of compulsory reporting on the gender pay gap across all sectors, uh, but I'm keen that that is done in such a way that is not necessarily about shaming businesses for getting things wrong or, or making them feel um, reluctant to deal with things properly because of that requirement, but one that is that goes hand in hand with a plan to reduce any gender pay gap when it's discovered in those businesses. And I, th I believe I've had very good conversations um, with some of those who, who represent the groups that have been calling for this kind of thing. Um, and I, I think that even though there hasn't to my knowledge, been much talk about making that a requirement. I think that it could have a very positive impact if it's framed properly. Supplemental question, please. Thank you, sir. Um, and carrying on from that, what, in the candidate's view, are the most press other pressing issues and challenges facing uh, diverse women and girls in children, um, girls mm. in Jersey? And the, could the candidate outline the specific strategies and initiatives that should be championed? to ensure more equal opportunities in Jersey as a whole for women and girls, regardless of their background or identity. Um, thank you, sir. Well, the big watershed moment that we've had very recently, of course, was the publication of the Violence Against Women and Girls um, report, which has a very large number of recommendations, uh, n none of which I could see being particularly um, objectionable. Um, I think that um, even though there will be overhaul in the government now, I don't want to see any momentum lost in examining that report and getting uh, a timeline in place for the implementation of those recommendations. There's some um, really, uh, I think, really important things in there to do with our criminal justice system, which uh, would make, a, I, think, I think, a huge benefit for people um, who, uh, who encounter uh, violence and abuse um, from their partners or, or from others. Uh, one idea, sir, that uh, I've had in the past that I would quite like to see is uh, some kind of temporary housing qualification system to support people when they are um, the victims of domestic violence to um, enable them to be able to um, find a new home and have the right to live there and not struggle because it was their partner who had the housing qualifications in that uh, relationship. That's something that can uh, put people off and end up trapping them and putting children in harm's way there, all because of an arbitrary rule to do with our housing qualification system. So I would like there to be some system either through um, the children's service or the, perhaps the police or whatever to offer some housing qualification system to enable um, uh, women to, uh, to use that. Thank you, sir. Uh, government projects, including but not limited to successive hospital projects, have been plagued with consultancy, design and change management fees that are hard for the public to reconcile with the outputs. What expectations does a candidate have on the ministerial lead for any project to scrutinise these costs personally and report to the Assembly on them? Um, so I think that transparency of costs is an important thing. Um, the Future Hospital Review Panel did make recommendations um, to that effect, which uh, not all of which were accepted by the outgoing government, so I would want to see that um, revisited. Uh, I have to say, sir, and uh, I've no idea what the previous candidates have, have said on the floor of this assembly, but I don't think it would be a wise thing for the new government, whoever heads it, to have some mass effort to go back to the drawing board and restart this whole process again or put so much of the work that's been done in the last 18 months into the bin. 
um, I think that would be repeating the same mistake that's made uh, before, and that would end up costing us tens of millions of pounds. I think we need to work with what we've got uh, and make the best of it. Supplemental question, then? Uh, yes, please. Uh, and then following up, does the candidate support ministers releasing and explaining design costs for projects at a more granular level than we have seen previously, including which firms are contracted for which services and how much different elements of a project cost and ensure that this clarity is built into projects from the outset and is not an afterthought. Um, so doing as much of that as possible early on can only be um, to the benefit of a project like that. Obviously, you've got to be careful with um, commercial sensitivity and make sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot and end up with a worse uh, commercial deal on, on projects like that. But the principle has to be as much transparency as possible because at the end of the day these are our projects and we might see them and decide we don't like them and want to do something different but we're not as um, informed to make those decisions if we don't have the detail. Deputy Renf. Yes sir. Uh, the candidate spoke just now about how the island's relationship with the UK is critical. Does the candidate believe that this relationship would be helped or hindered by a chief minister who has frequently criticised the Labour leader with whom he may have to deal with as the next Prime Minister? Thank you, sir. You could equally ask that question to the leader of any devolved government in the UK. I think it's right that people speak with political conviction and we will agree to disagree on many issues and we ought to be able in a democratic and free society to express those. That doesn't mean that... Um, when you have direct uh, engagements with, uh, government, with UK government ministers or officers, that those are uh, unpleasant. In those circumstances, you put the island first and you get whatever deal needs to be done for the island. But um, there are pl plenty of political systems around the world where there are uh, different heads of government within the overall country structure where they are able to disagree very strongly. Supplemental question, <laughs> Yes, so, so the job of Chief Minister is to represent Jersey's interests um, rather than advise the UK on their best interests. So is he saying that he would make no compromises in his tweeting policy or other social media interactions if he was Chief Minister? Uh, no, sir. As I said, I believe in freedom of speech and I believe in speaking according your, to your political convictions, but that doesn't, have, that doesn't have to have any impact on your direct relationships with people when you work, on them, well, work with them. And so I've served on scrutiny panels with members with whom I will have had great public um, political disagreements with, but when you sit around the table, you get on with the job. Are there any other questions for this candidate? Deputy it follows on from um, Deputy Renoff's question. Does the, um, give, given the fact that um, the candidate has had some quite strong words for human rights abusers around the world, does he think that he would be uh, comfortable at pursuing uh, the policy of previous governments where they seem to ignore uh, the human rights record of countries they want to do business with simply to get a few quid in extra for, for Jersey? Um, so I, I don't have a policy of complete disengagement from those who you have strong disagreements with, but I uh, will have a policy, and this was in our um, manifesto, of not participating in any kind of um, promotion of individuals who have bad human rights records. I think what we've sometimes seen in the past of... Um, I, I remember when it was the king of Saudi Arabia who died a few years ago, a message was sent from Jersey in terms that I thought was quite embarrassing given what a horrendous human rights um, record that particular country had. And um, there's ways of engaging diplomatically without selling out on your principles and I wouldn't take part in positive promotion for those kinds uh, of uh, human rights abusers. Supplementary. Uh, Deputy Balash. So if the candidate is not elected as uh, Chief Minister, would he be prepared to serve in a cabinet led by Deputy Farnham? And uh, if the answer to that is yes, uh, would he be intending to draw up a coalition agreement with the Chief Minister? Um, so th the answer to that will ultimately depend on uh, what... Um, the winning chief ministerial candidate would be uh, prepared to, uh, to consider. Um, I don't necessarily feel like a, a written coalition agreement 
is the right thing at this time. I personally think in the future that ought to be a normal <coughs> feature of politics because it provides transparency and accountability. Um, and th that, that is a normal feature of politics in lots of other jurisdictions. Um, in that obviously highly unlikely eventuality uh, of, of that being the outcome of uh, today, uh, then I would have to give it serious thoughts, but I, I, I'm not at this point inclined to think that a formal coalition deal uh, would be the best way at this moment in time. Supplementary question, yeah. Deputy Miller. Thank you, sir. The candidate has been critical this morning, as his party have been previously, of government's practice, in which we're not alone, of conducting reviews, consultation and investigation before implementing and rolling out new policies. Will he tell us what he will do to test that his policies will work as he, as he expects before rolling them out and making sure that they do not create lasting damage to our economy or create unintended consequences or will he just roll them out anyway and hope for the best? Um, so, um, I would be very grateful to hear of, an, of a way of how a policy can be tested without implementing it that isn't uh, reliant on clairvoyance. Um, <laughs> you, can look at, you can look at various studies and that ought to inform your policies, but so I believe that that is often what we have done in forming our policies. We look at examples from elsewhere, we look at whatever economic uh, um, uh, studies are available to inform that, but when a political decision has been made that there's a particular route um, to go down, I think it is a feature of Jersey politics that consultations are often used to prevaricate and to uh, delay decisions being made because they might be a controversial decision. I think at the end of the day, if governments implement policies according to their mandate and they turn out not to work so well or are unpopular, the best solution for dealing with that is the next election where those people ought to be thrown out of power for not doing a good enough job. But I think if we constantly prevaricate and delay and not make decisions, that often actually ends up costing us a lot more uh, in the long run. And that is a policy that has been tested and tried in Jersey uh, to, our, um, great <laughs> to our great indulgence previously. Supplemental question. Thank you, sir. Um, given that the Reform Party among them have uh, 5,000 votes, I believe, approximately, does he really believe that he has a mandate to enforce policies and laws on this island without consultation or, or discussion with the public as a whole across the island? Uh, well, so that's more than any other individual candidate would have, but every member who sits in this assembly is here on their own personal mandate, and no member who is elected should ever apologise for trying to fulfil the commitments they made to the public to get to this assembly in the first place. I do not believe that politics is some kind of objective process where the purpose of running for election is that you get the honour of being a part of the most boring social club on the island, and then you just outsource every kind of decision uh, to some other body and have an objective process and we'll just come to whatever conclusion we do. The point of democracy is that the public get to choose what policies they live under and every member of this assembly does not have to disregard their manifesto because it wasn't identical to the manifesto of the other 48 members of this assembly. Deputy Kovac. Thank you, sir. Uh, what does the candidate intend to do to revive the farming and fishery industry? And so I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that we've been able to meet with the uh, Jersey Farmers Union and the Fishermen's Association uh, several times uh, in uh, the last couple of years. And uh, given that it wasn't that long ago that we didn't particularly see eye to eye on much, I think that shows how, how far we've come uh, to the fact that now we have on many occasions sat around a table with them and talked about our common ground and issues that we know they care about. Um, we know that those industries uh, in particular are worried about newcomers into them. So new people um, getting a, a fishing vessel and going into that industry or uh, people trying to acquire farmlands so that they can um, set up there. Um, that's something that those who are now coming up to retirement age in those industries are extremely worried about. So I, I'm pleased that we've been able to develop a good relationship with them in recent months and I would want to work with them to see how we can do that. But what I certainly wouldn't want to do is to roll back on the previous very positive decision that this assembly made to provide an uplift in the funding that we provide to those industries because I think that was uh, much needed and it was a, a, a good example of the assembly doing something right for those industries. 
Supplemental question? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. And what plan uh, does he have on having the farming, fishery, tourism, and hospitality industry working in synergy to revive all those areas? Um, so, well, uh, one of the areas that they um, uh, that they all have in common, of course, is food. That's all part of what they do there. And Jersey's very lucky to have um, so many, um, I think, really interesting and, and diverse restaurants here. Uh, I'm quite worried about some of the talk that there has been about new taxes and charges on businesses. In particular, we've talked about a waste disposal charge, which I would be worried that if such a thing is imposed on those businesses at some arbitrary level, could end up causing more uh, damage. And I would much prefer that if we're going to um, have any kind of charging or taxing arrangement on businesses, it ought to be on the basis of profitability, not set at an arbitrary level, because then if a business is doing really well, it can afford to make more, but if it's going through a bit of a difficult time, then it would get a break uh, on, the, uh, on the tax front. And I think that principle is, is much more, uh, will end up being much more supportive to those um, industries. Thank you, sir. Will the candidates commit to the introduction of a living wage by the end of 2025? And if not, why not? Uh, yes, is the extremely short answer to, to, yes, is the extremely short answer uh, to that, sir. That commitment has been made. I don't think that we should row back on it. And I was thoroughly unimpressed with the government report that was published that uh, said it, it had a sentence in it, basically, about how the economic conditions aren't appropriate for it, uh, without elaborating at all as to why that is the case and without referring to the economic conditions of the people that the policy is actually meant to help. So, no, I think we ought to stick to that target. Supplemental question? Uh, Deputy Scott. Thank you, sir. Um, has the um, candidate read the barriers to business report? And um, if so, what recommendations do he think are most important to prioritise? Uh, so I've not read every single word of that report, but I have read uh, some of the highlights of it. And I think that um, the, uh, the, ge the, the general point that it's getting at to um, make sure that businesses who are operating in Jersey have a much easier relationship with government, with less bureaucracy that they have to, um, have to abide by is something that I'm entirely supportive of. Um, I, um, I think that whoever is the next economic development minister should be given a task of... Um, rapidly responding to that with more detail. I, I, I do think that there have been a few economic documents recently that have been, I think, too high level to be celebrated that much. And so I, I, I think we ought to move away from that and uh, try to uh, provide for reports like that that provide greater detail so we can get on with things more quickly. Supplemental question, Deputy Scott. Uh, yes, please. Um, the to what extent um, would um, the, the, to the extent that the um, uh, de the uh, candidate does um, feel that the increase of the living wage um, doesn't form a barrier to business, could he perhaps explain how he would address poten the potential inflationary impact in um, areas like um, f the, the food retail industry? So could she, she clarify the question? I, I, I wasn't sure if that was a question more about the kind of larger, more established retail industry or whether it was smaller businesses in, in other sectors for whom that might be a consideration. Can you clarify just that point, please, Deputy Scott? Certainly, sir. I could give an example of supermarkets and just um, the potential in inflationary impact of increasing the minimum wage to the living wage there and how the, um, uh, the candidate would address the inflationary impact. Um, so a few years ago, we commissioned uh, Oxera to do an economic study uh, on this. That was a result of a proposition that I brought that examined what it thought would be the poten potential scenarios of different levels of uprate in the minimum wage, including, I think, one was to raise it to two-thirds of, uh, of median earnings right away. 
And even I was surprised at their conclusions that they did not think that it would have much of an inflationary impact. It might cause a bit of movement from some people from, uh, from one job that suddenly became unviable, but then it would generate more economic activity elsewhere that could create another job, which would be a higher paying job there. So when we have uh, commissioned the experts to do economic studies into this, they haven't reported back that they would think that the living wage in particular would have such inflationary impacts, and uh, I'm inclined to think they probably know what they're talking about. Uh, Deputy Renov. Yes, sir. The States is due to debate P82 2023 on offshore wind in March. Will the candidate be supporting this proposition? Um, so, uh, at this point, I haven't made up my mind on the proposition itself. Uh, I'm in two minds about it for this reason. Um, the first, sir, is that I'm not in clear in my head what the proposition is actually seeking to achieve. Of course, sir, I like the idea of Jersey having a big renewable energy project, project and all the pride that will come to the island from having such a thing, but I do not want it to be um, tokenistic and I don't want it to uh, not have real benefits for Jersey. Uh, it depends on the conditions of it. If we're to set up uh, an offshore wind farm next to the Sambria wind farm uh, and we decide that the cable to get to the electricity for Jersey would be better value for money if we just attach it to the ones nearby already going to France, then we don't really end up with energy uh, security or independence at the end of it, which I think would be a waste of time. Uh, if all we do is rent some space on the seabed to some multinational conglomerate or hedge fund or whatever to make loads of money out of it, then actually we might be um, shooting ourselves in the foot with our own publicly owned electricity company. And I don't necessarily think that would be worth it, especially when you consider that our um, electricity is already pretty much carbon free anyway, so we wouldn't even be reducing our carbon emissions by much. But sir, if we got it right, had the cable dealt with properly and had the ownership of it, it could be a huge opportunity to bring energy bills down, have pride in such a scheme like that and provide energy independence. So if the detail were right, I'd be wholeheartedly behind it. Supplementary question, Deputy Renov. Conor Tarbison, Brillard. Thank you, sir. Reform Jersey's policies tend to involve increased spending. How would the candidate propose to fund these? So I, th I think um, most government policies involve increased spending, uh, to be fair. Um, that's not anything unique to us. You, you, know, you can't do something without spending money to either employ the people um, to do it or to funnel funds to, to whatever project um, you're working on. Um, so I think that there, there is an immense amount of money that could be saved uh, in government by reducing our reliance on consultants. I think that there's an immense amount of money that could be saved by focusing some of what we do on earlier intervention rather than services that um, serve people at the end of an issue. One of the reasons I've been so supportive of reducing the cost of primary health care is because that is an investment in people's long-term health so that you don't need to spend as much on them uh, later on. Um, I appreciate that that's very difficult to calculate and, and demonstrate in a spreadsheet, but I think the principle counts there that you can do better if you target your money more effectively. <coughs> Supplementary question? Uh, and so, really to finish that one off, does the candidate support the philosophy of tax and spend? Well, I'd, I'd love to know another way of running a government. <laughs> Deputy Tadier. Thank you, sir. Um, is the uh, candidate committed to, um, in, uh, to, to a human rights and equalities commissioner or, and or uh, a minister? Uh, and what's his general feeling about uh, where Jersey needs to perhaps take more care uh, in this area? Um, so I think that the example that the Children's Commissioner has set in establishing an office that exists to promote and defend <coughs> children's rights and have the ability to take up cases and see them through the court system in support of people whose rights aren't um, abided by, uh, I, I think that sets a, sets a good example of what an Equality and Human Rights Commissioner could do in Jersey. Um, obviously, we'd have to do some thinking about the best way of forming such an institution and the best way of empowering it. Uh, but I think um, having human rights is 
one thing if they're simply on paper, but if you have no ability when your human rights are denied to challenge it somehow and get justice and get change, so the systems that infringed on your human rights um, uh, are changed, um, then they can be worthless. So having some kind of body to help people, many of whom won't have much recourse to uh, financial means to get lawyers to help them challenge those things uh, could potentially be a very positive thing and if the government engages with it properly it will help us identify some of the laws that we might need to change which again would save us money in future challenges. Supplemental question. Yeah. So um, the, the island has a wealth of legal expertise uh, and we obviously have our own judicial system which I, I think is respected um, certainly around the world in, in certain areas sir. Um, do, does the uh, candidate believe that some of the legal uh, expertise that we have on Ireland um, could be used to inform government and the Assembly in an open and transparent way, um, rather than necessarily in the way that it's traditionally been, where uh, legal advice to ministers has been um, remained secret and confidential, when actually these could be, uh, uh, there could be a public body that informs the wider conversation around these issues? Um, yes, so and I've, I felt for some time actually that in uh, particular pieces of work that there would be great benefit in going to some of uh, Jersey's lawyers, many of whom have very um, specific expertise in particular areas that could offer us very good advice and uh, help on that. Um, I, uh, there's, uh, there's lots of reforms I'd like to see to the um, Attorney General's office, not least um, the establishment of an independent prosecution service, uh, but I think there are some good expertise in our um, uh, our local lawyers that we would be, um, we ought to benefit from. Very well. Um, there's one second left. So uh, I think that draws to an end of the time available uh, for questions to this candidate. But therefore, I'd like uh, Deputies Gorst and Farnham to be brought back into the chamber, please. Rafia, can I ask if the Connetab of Trinity has um, maintained a presence and he's, he's capable of voting? Yes. And I just uh, note for members' sake that although he was marked excuse, the Connetab of Trinity has made contact and therefore will have a vote that counts uh, in, the, in the Assembly for these purposes. Uh, Very well, uh, just to repeat for the benefit of Deputies Gorst and Farnham that the Connet Harbour Trinity who had been marked excuse has made contact and therefore will be counted in the vote um, when the votes are passed. Now all three candidates uh, have spoken and answered questions so we now move on to the vote. As there are three candidates, pre-printed ballot papers will be issued and used. Members must write their own name and indicate their preferred candidate on the pre-printed ballot paper provided. If any member wishes to abstain, they'll need to indicate accordingly on the pre-printed paper. So I now invite the usher to distribute ballot papers. Just reiterate that members should write their own name. The reason for that is because it's a recorded ballot on the paper. 
uh, if there is if a member does not write their own name before indicating that will be treated uh, as a spoiled vote and will not be counted write their own name and then they indicate their preferred candidate. <coughs> the vote will obviously be indicated by those who are remote uh, by their presence online. <coughs> Can I ask, please, does everyone have a ballot paper? Very well. Or does anyone not have a ballot paper? Right. Um, then would people please complete their ballot papers in the way that I've indicated? Is there anyone who has not completed their ballot paper? Very well, collect the votes, please, and show the boxes, please. Show them. So they're not full of any pre-printed forms or anything of that nature. And would you please collect the votes. Has any member not put their completed ballot paper in one of the two ballot boxes? Very well. Then uh, I ask the Viscount and Deputy Greffier to retire to count the vote. At this moment, it's an opportunity for light entertainment, community singing, humming or something to that... Uh, if, if only, if only it were in accordance with standing orders.
It's an old joke, but it's a classic one. <laughs> Have a sorting hat.
If it turns out that people's names have been unreadable on the web, I'm just speculating. Um, 
we have a whole set and we can do it again. And this time it'll have to be block capitals. So um, let's, let's hope that won't be necessary. Very well. The results of the ballot for Chief Minister designate can be announced. Uh, Deputy Gorst, uh, 21 votes. Deputy Farnham, 17 votes. Deputy Bezek, 10 votes. One abstention. No spoiled papers. Very well. As uh, no candidate... So could we ask for the abstention initially? Deputy Wilson abstained. As uh, no candidates received more than half the votes cast, the candidate with the lowest number of votes, Deputy Mezek in this case, shall withdraw from the contest and a further recorded vote for the Office of Chief Minister designate shall take place. There are now only two candidates remaining, Deputy Gorst and Deputy Farnham. And simply by dint of uh, the order uh, that they were drawn from the hat, um, we will use the electronic voting system. Any member wishing to vote for Deputy Gorse should press the P button. Any member wishing to vote for Deputy Farnham should press the C button. Any member wishing to abstain from the vote should press the A button uh, as usual. And members participating remotely should indicate their vote in the chat in the usual way. <coughs> Any members not in the Assembly, I invite to return to their seats and I invite the greffier to open the voting. The vote is now open and I ask members to cast their vote. I repeat, any member wishing to vote for Deputy Gorse presses the P button. Any member wishing to vote for Deputy Farnham presses the C button. If members have had the opportunity of casting their votes, have you got all the, Greffier, do we have all the, all the remote votes in? Then I ask the Greffier to close the voting.
Just double check the. Uh... Very well. Uh, the uh, voting is as follows uh, Deputy Gorse, 22 votes, Deputy Farnham, 27 votes. No abstention. Accordingly, Deputy Farnham has been appointed as Chief Minister designate. So may I just take this opportunity, first of all, to thank my fellow candidates for a very fair and forthright election. Can, can I um, thank uh, my supporters for the support and the help and advice they've given me throughout the week? Can I thank all members for their participation and just say, sir, that um, I hope we can have a more United Assembly, sir. And I want to reiterate, sir, the door is open to all members in the uh, in relation to forming a government and taking the Assembly forward, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Farnham. That concludes the public business for this meeting. The Chief Minister-designate is reminded that he should submit uh, his list of ministerial candidates to the Greffier by 9.30 a.m. on Monday. The list will then be circulated to members and published on the State's Assembly website. In accordance with standing orders, the Chief Minister designate may state the reasons for his nominations, but is not obliged to do so. Very well, the Assembly stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday, the 30th of January, where members will be appointed to ministerial office. It's customary to stand when the chair stands, please.